Okay. The committee will Thanks. come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Good morning. Today, we welcome Mr. Rohit Chopra, the newly confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau before our committee. Dr. Chopra, you have inherited an agency that was undermined by the Trump administration, which actively worked to reduce consumer protections and enable predatory behavior against the most vulnerable. For example, Mick Mulvaney and Kathy Craninger weakened the CFPB's Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity. During their tenure, only a total of four CFPB Fair Lending Enforcement actions were taken. And regulator referrals and regulator referrals to the Department of Justice for potential equal credit opportunity act violations declined by 58%. Thankfully, their efforts to eliminate the CFPB were unsuccessful. The CFPB was founded on the principles of protecting consumers from unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices in the financial marketplace. Since its inception, the CFPB has uncovered illegal, predatory, and discriminatory conduct toward consumers, returning over $13.4 billion to cover 175 million consumers who were taken advantage of by bad actors. Unfortunately, at a critical time during the COVID-19 pandemic, the Trump administration left consumers exposed. The CFPB reported early this year that homeowners of color continue to face significant challenges. Specifically, while black and Latinx borrowers represent only 18% of all mortgage borrowers, they are nearly three times as likely as white borrowers to report being behind on their mortgage payments or having a mortgage in forbearance. It is critical that the CFPB provides strong oversight of mortgage services to ensure they proactively work with all borrowers providing affordable loan modifications to avoid unnecessary foreclosures. Furthermore, the COVID-19 crisis highlighted the predatory behavior of debt collectors as thousands of people struggle to make ends meet and keep up with rent. A legal aid attorney from Texas testified that debt collectors made record profits by aggressively pursuing default judgments and in some cases seizing stimulus payments and unemployment benefits deposited into bank accounts. And let's not forget the role of the CFPB in promoting responsible innovation. With the rise of financial technology, the CFPB must take action to ensure that consumers have more control over their own data and are protected from discrimination and predatory products or services. Last week, you issued orders for information from big tech firms operating digital payment systems to learn among other things, how they're handling sensitive consumer data and to what extent they're following the consumer protection laws. So, Director Chopra, I look forward to your testimony and your leadership at a revitalized CFPB that can be strong and be the strong watchdog Congress always intended to protect consumers, especially those who have experienced historical discrimination, such as people of color, women and low wage workers, among others. <clears throat> I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for holding the hearing today. Um, and I'm glad to see the committee following up on uh, our statutorily required uh, oversight hearings um, and uh, holding the semi-annual review of the CFPB on time. Uh, and I want to congratulate you on that because there's been an alarming trend that committee Democrats are scrapping these statutory required hearings. And um, I hope that we're back on track now. So Director Chopra, welcome uh, before the committee. Uh, thank you for being here. I know you've been in this room many times before, but thank you for your first time testifying. As you know, we have a lot to discuss. Over the last several months, the CFPB has issued many new and concerning rules, guidance, 
as, as well as policy statements and revoke some important actions completely um, completed under previous leadership. Uh, the Bureau uh, has also delayed implementation of major rulemakings, causing regulatory uncertainty. It's problematic. I'd like to hear more about how the Bureau came to those conclusions um, and why those actions were necessary. Um, but I know you've only been director for a month. Uh, none of those decisions were uh, of your making. It was acting director uh, uh, Weijiao who was calling the shots for the last nine months. And he was unconfirmed. Um, he acted as an unaccountable bureaucrat making those decisions. And uh, I think the decisions were harmful to small businesses and consumers. Um, but now we have you, a Senate confirmed, uh, but still wholly unaccountable. Uh, under the organizational structure, under the law of the CFPB, uh, a wholly unaccountable Democrat CFPB director. And I think we've seen this one before. Uh, this is not new. Um, and as you pointed out in your statements to Bureau staff, you were there at the inception of the Bureau, one of the first employees more than a decade ago. Um, and under the leadership of Senator Warren and uh, former Director Cordray, you were an active participant in uh, the CFPB's regulation by enforcement. Um, I'd like, uh, I would hope that having uh, witnessed the harmful impacts of uh, that style of regulation, uh, you'd come to a different conclusion about how you will act as director. Uh, the Bureau's overreach um, was substantial at the time. Um, and, um, in, but frankly, uh, what we've heard from you in your statements is that uh, you, or like many of the Democrats we've been dealing with here on the Hill, uh, the, the Democrats seem to have learned nothing and yet forgotten nothing. Um, and you've made it clear uh, in your statements that the CFPB will be run by basically Richard Cordray 2.0. Um, and um, I'd like to hear some differences, but so far I've yet to hear substantial differences. Uh, the, name, the main difference between now and then is that the Supreme Court um, has uh, recognized that what Republicans were saying um, is that the CFPB's leadership structure is unconstitutional. Um, we think this is a good first step, but now it's time for Congress to rein in the Bureau uh, and create an accountable agency. Um, there are a number of Republican proposals to accomplish uh, such, uh, such a goal. Uh, take, for instance, Congressman Barr's TABS Act to bring the CFPB's funding under annual congressional appropriations, or Congressman Lukemeyer's bill to make the Bureau a five-member commission. We also have Congressman Loudermilk's Taylor Act to tailor regulatory actions to limit the burden on institutions and give great, great clarity. Uh, we also have Congressman Williams' bill to remo remove abusive uh, from the UDAP um, and, uh, and make, the, make sure that the Bureau can't make rules uh, of the road as they sort of go along. Um, and Congressman Emmer's bill to require a review of all proposed and existing guidance, orders, rules, and regulations and create a whistleblower uh, reward program at the CFPB. Uh, I think there are things that we can come to terms with in this, in this ba basket of Republican policy offerings here. These are simple, common sense solutions that we should talk more about today. Um, instead, I know that Democrats have atta attached a long list of their partisan priorities uh, uh, to this hearing. Uh, because they continue to, uh, you know, focus on a far left agenda, trying to pass here in the in the House of Representatives and through the Senate. Um, Republicans are more interested in getting answers about your agenda, uh, Director Chopra, and and um, how your decisions will impact small businesses and American families. Um, and um, we want it to be different than last time. We do. Um, and my hope is that you have um, a, a different approach um, than your predecessors. Um, Madam Chair, I ask you to consent to insert for the record uh, the list of Republican initiatives in more detail of the Without reforms objection. to the Bureau uh, to ensure that it actually helps consumers. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member McHenry. I now recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chopra, congratulations on your appointment, and welcome back to our committee. I'm excited to have a champion for consumers at the CFPB. The pandemic has produced a great deal of fear and uncertainty in our country, and having strong consumer protections during the economic recovery is critical to building back better. 
When consumers know they have someone on their side, it helps them have a little more faith in the economic system and their own future. The Bureau is faced with many important issues like helping consumers have more control over their own data, ensuring lenders aren't engaged in sharp practices, and making sure student borrowers are treated fairly. Now, as is this committee's tradition with CFPB directors, I'm sure Mr. Chopra will get nothing but softball questions today, and there will be broad bipartisan agreement on the mission, scope, and structure of the Bureau. Madam Chair, I look forward to hearing Mr. Chopra's testimony, and I yield back. Thank you. I want to welcome today's distinguished witness, the Honorable Arohit Chopra, Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer on the desk in front of you that will indicate how much time you have left. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony when your time has expired. Director Chopra, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and all members of the committee. I appreciate you holding this hearing today. 2021 is very different than 2020. The economy is reopening and growing, labor demand is strong, and employers have added millions of new jobs. Household spending is increasing, and demand for housing is robust. While these macro indicators are promising, the recovery has been uneven. In many parts of our country, conditions remain fragile. Many families are struggling to afford their mortgages and their rent payments, and many small businesses are facing very severe challenges to make ends meet. Many communities, especially those have, that have been historically disadvantaged, have not felt much of a recovery. American families now owe $15 trillion in household debt, roughly $800 billion more than at the end of 2019, before the pandemic. Over the course of 12 months, mortgage origination hit historic highs at $4.6 trillion. The CARES Act has kept delinquency rates on mortgages and student loans at relatively low levels. However, many of the borrower forbearance programs have expired, so we lack a complete picture about distress. Many family farmers continue to conf confront significant challenges in staying afloat, and medical debt in collections continues to grow as a concern for households. Congress has asked the CFPB to monitor market conditions to spot risks and meet other statutory objectives. Most importantly, right now, I've asked staff at the CFPB to carefully monitor the mortgage market, including foreclosures. It is critical for our economy that families do not experience unnecessary hardship or errors and that disruptions in the mortgage market do not impede a fragile recovery. We are keen on understanding how homeowners from different segments of the population are faring, including communities of color, military-connected families, older Americans, first-time homeowners, and family farmers. Technological progress holds the potential for enormous benefits for households and the economy, particularly with respect to real-time consumer payments. In recent years, though, big tech has sought to gain greater control over the flow of money and data in our economy. Last week, the CFPB issued orders to dominant firms such as Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon to shed light on their payment system practices. How will these giants harvest, track, and monetize data about our spending habits? How will they decide who gets kicked off their payment platforms. We will also be studying some of the practices of Chinese tech giants like WeChat Pay and Alipay. This effort will inform other initiatives to ensure that our evolving payments landscape is in alignment with competition, consumer protection, and our national interest. More broadly, the CFPB intends to use its tools to promote an equitable and inclusive recovery and given the existing economic conditions and these tools, I expect to have several areas of focus. 
First, we must find ways to create more competition in markets under our jurisdiction. For example, I am concerned that many Americans could be paying lower rates on their mortgages and credit cards and earning higher rates on their savings. We plan to listen carefully to local financial institutions and nascent competitors on the obstacles they face when seeking to challenge dominant incumbents, including in big tech. Second, the CFPB will sharpen its focus on repeat offenders, repeat offenders that violate agency and court orders, harm families, and law-abiding businesses. Third, we must work to restore relationship banking in this era of big data. Too many households and businesses have no place to turn to when they need help, especially when they face errors, problems, and other issues in their financial lives. The inability to cut through red tape and get help in one's financial life can be a major obstacle when seeking a job or when applying for credit. Preserving relationship banking is critical to our nation's resilience and recovery, particularly in these times of stress. Thank you again for this opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Director Chopra. It is refreshing to have a consumer financial protection expert leading the CFPB once again. So I will now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. While I knew a Republican administration would appoint <coughs> individuals to run the CFPB with a different approach to consumer protection, it was appalling to watch the former and twice impeached president appoint individuals lacking in qualifications with the sole mission to destroy the CFPB. After this effort failed, I sincerely hope my Republican colleagues will cease politicizing the CFPB and drop their efforts to undermine its work. Director Chopra, there are many important issues the CFPB can play, where they can play a meaningful role, including fair lending, payday lending, credit reporting, debt collection, student lending, and promoting responsible innovation that helps all consumers. Will you commit to not only reversing prior efforts to weaken consumer protections on many of these fronts, but re-examine ways to provide even greater protections for consumers? For example, instead of simply restoring CFPB's 2017 payday loan rule that Mick Mulvaney and Kathy Craninger weakened. Will you realize the full extent of your authority to strengthen the original rule so we can put an end to the debt trap too many borrowers, including borrowers of color, have experienced at the hands of predatory payday lenders? Thank you for the question, Madam Chairwoman. Um, of course, we are doing everything to monitor every single one of those markets carefully. There's obviously a lot of fluxes in the economy, things are changing, and we need to make sure we're acting before it's too late um, and anticipate those risks. You know, I, I was very um, affected by the foreclosure crisis after Lehman Brothers. And I think we saw that regulators acted too late, missed some of the key smoke signals, and the results were very devastating to homeowners. And with respect to all of the issues you've raised, I'm gonna be looking at all of those markets carefully to see how we can make the markets more fair, transparent, and competitive as the law directs us to do. Thank you. One policy area that I believe warrants more attention by the CFPB and by Congress is mortgage servicing. As we saw during the 20, uh, 08 financial crisis, shoddy mortgage servicing practices led to far too many unnecessary foreclosures uh, when a reasonable loan modification would have made such a difference to keep homeowners in their homes with additional benefits for their neighbors and communities. I'm glad the CFPB <laughs> issued a rule earlier this year to provide some safeguards for homeowners exiting forbearance during the pandemic to ensure mortgage services are communicating with them about loan modification options before initiating foreclosures. However, those enhanced protections expire at the end of the year. Data in 
indicate that over 800,000 homeowners will still be seriously delinquent at the ex expiration of the Bureau's rule, approximately twice the number at the start of the pandemic. A significant portion of those homeowners have FHA-insured loans, which are disproportionately held by the bars of color uh, hit hardest by the pandemic. For moreover, money from the Homeowner Assistance Fund <coughs> will not be available to many homeowners until next year. Have you seen lenders proactively offer affordable loan modifications to help homeowners stay in their homes? Do you expect to see a significant increase in the number of foreclosures in the next future, in the near future, based on the uh, data that you're analyzing right now? So it, the issue of foreclosures is, is a number one on my mind. Um, what we saw a decade ago was that problems in mor the mortgage market rebounded through the entire financial system and the effect on individual homeowners, and that was disproportionately those neighborhoods historically disadvantaged, they suffered the most. So as I understand, um, we are closely monitoring the servicers activities, working with the other bank regulators to make sure we understand where there are risks of illegal foreclosures to make sure we're using all of our tools to stop them. We can, the CFPB will not be successful unless it is carefully monitoring what is happening in housing and particularly related to foreclosures. Thank you very much. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is the ranking member of the committee is now recognized for five minutes. Well, Director Chopra, I, I'm gonna start with the same question I asked Director Cordray in 2012, and it was about the, uh, the word abusive. I wrote you a letter about this. Thank you for the response. Thank you for the timely response. Um, we're off to a good start. Um, you know, Director Craniger, uh, Craniger put in uh, some, a policy statement about abusive, providing clarity. But you wrote in your letter, quote, articulated principles actually have the effect of hampering certainty over time, end quote. How so? Uh, so I think what I intended to say there is that the way in which that policy statement was previously written, it did not actually provide clarity on the analytical framework that would be used. So, Is it your intention to do so? Uh, the, the, I, have I have huge, huge aspirations to create a durable jurisprudence and with respect to that. And that so durable jurisprudence, does that mean that the courts will define what abusive is? So it could be a mix, it could be a mix of of course, our judicial branch interpreting statute. It's also about how the CFPB may use rules and guidance to help articulate those standards. So, so rules, rules are very important, right? Rules are very important. Clear, uh, clarity for those that you're regulating is important. And they're, therefore, they can follow the rules and they'll know what the rule book says. Don't you acknowledge that that's important, especially on something that is a, a new standard? Well, there's... I, Without going into too much boredom. Oh, I love the, the boredom. The, it's fantastic. The history of, I used to serve at the FTC, and the FTC had an unfairness standard that um, took some time to litigate cases, to develop rules, to develop a clear analytical framework. And I agree, we all need to make sure that we are living up to what Congress was seeking to prohibit with abusive. There is actually much okay, more. Okay, so a decade in. A decade in, what you're saying is we don't yet have a standard for abusive. Well, we have a standard in the statute that has a, a essentially multi-prong approach. The courts so far have not had too much of a difficult time, as I understand it, interpreting it. But that being said, there is place for guidance. There is place for litigation. There is place for rules. And, and right now, what we FTC see from your, your from your actions previously and previous Democrat directors is that regulation is how they're going to is not how they're going to do it. It's going to be through enforcement. Are you going to emphasize regulation or enforcement? So, uh, when you say regulation, do you mean through the rule writing process? Right. We have a normal APA process. Do you intend to adhere to the Administrative Procedures Act? Oh well, writing, we will writing. always adhere to the Administrative Thank Procedure you. Act. So, but the issue mm -hmm. of abusive rulemaking, just to as a matter of statutory construction. Congress required rulemaking under that section to trigger two things. One is state AG uh, enforcement over national banks, and the second 
is FTC enforcement over non-banks. Other sections of the law required rulemaking prior <coughs> to the sections uh, going into effect, but as I said, I'm very committed to try and create a durable jurisprudence. Let me ask you again. just a couple things for the record. Sure. Uh, do you fully intend to cooperate with the Inspector General's um, uh, investigations? All of them. All right. Um, and is it, um, it, it, what's your view of congressional oversight? Well, I, as you may know, I have appeared. We're Congress. Many, we many, like to hear that you like it. Okay. Right? Whether or not appeared, you personally like it is kind of not relevant to the question. But. I've appeared many, many times. I have responded and testified many times. And I'll tell you, I came from an agency at the FT FTC that in many ways had, in my view, absolute contempt for Congress and ignored statutes, letters, and, and I hope to be able to provide uh, and be responsive. So you hope to be better than the FTC. Got it. So we had the SELA um, litigation before the Supreme Court. In effect, the court ruled that, that your agency is, in effect, part of the executive branch, is a consi considered part of it. it. So my question is, is it your intention to adhere to executive orders issued by President Biden? Uh, so executive orders, as I understand, I, are not binding on the CFPB. There may be some other types of regulations that are required by statute to apply to all agencies, re regardless of their independent or not. But I take the CFPB's, you know, it is a the newest part of the Federal Reserve System, and so, we, the entire Federal Reserve System. So let, let me ask you a final question. Um, executive order, uh, 12866, which is issued by President Clinton, uh, requires significant regulatory actions to be submitted for review by the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. Do you intend to submit significant regulations? As I understand from our statute that that is not part of the process, but um, with respect to certain principles, we will adhere to all the statutory requirements uh, on rulemaking. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee, on oversight and reform is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the, the chairwoman for yielding. Director Chopra, congr congratulations on your confirmation. I must say it is welcome news to again have a CFPB director who is dedicated to putting consumers first. Uh, I wanna to touch on two <coughs> issues today. As you know, I was the author of the Credit Card Act of 2009 which ended the unfair, deceptive, abusive practices of the credit card industry and leveled the playing field between cardholders and credit card companies. A 2015 CFPB study estimated that this legisl legislation alone saved consumers over $16 billion in the first years of its enactment. Other studies have shown that it saves $20 billion a year this uh, 2015 study was the last year CFPB reported the cumulative benefits to consumers. The 2017, 2019, and 2021 reports don't do so. And I worry that if we stop talking about the benefits of the CARD Act or take our eye off the ball, that industry may attempt uh, to roll back some of these important protections again or, or resort to its past abusive practices. So, Director Chopra, yes or no, will you reinstitute CFPB's past practice of reporting the cumulative benefits for consumers of the CARD Act in future reports as the Obama administration did? Congressman, I do believe, I, I may be mistaken, that that is required to give a full picture of the card market, and I fully intend to make sure we report to Congress appropriately on that. Thank you. And are there any other areas of particular concern for you in today's credit card mar market that you believe merits further consideration by the CFPB or by Congress? So I think if you look at many of the consumer complaints and you look at some other market data, um, obviously people are concerned about uh, whether assessments of certain types of fees are, have been appropriate, um, whether they're actually due to system errors. Um, I think in the credit card industry writ large, I am concerned that not enough Americans are uh, taking advantage of moving their balances or finding lower rates. Many of Americans qualify for lower rates than they might be paying. 
and a competitive and fair market would mean that those consumers could uh, move or find lower rates and that could save them a lot of money. Um, I, I believe in 2019, Congresswoman, Americans paid, I think, 90 or $100 billion in credit card interest and fees, and obviously a more competitive market would be to the benefit wow. of all issuers and, uh, and consumers as well. Thank you. Uh, changing gears, Director Chopra, what if I told you that I had a regular cup of coffee to sell you and that was going to cost you $40? Uh, yes or no, would you buy this cup of coffee? Uh, I've not had a, a cup of coffee that would be worth it for that much. <laughs> of course, Knight, and I, I can't imagine anyone who would say yes to that offer. Unfortunately, a $40 cup of coffee or sandwich from a bodega is too common of an occurrence today due to the abusive, unfair, and excessive overdraft fees charged by our nation's financial institutions, taking billions of dollars out of the pockets of hardworking Americans every year. That's why I've introduced with many of my colleagues on this committee, H.R. 4277, the Overdraft Protection Act, legislation that would crack down on predatory overdraft fees and establish fair, transparent uh, programs. In 2012, uh, the CFPB launched an inquiry into overdraft practices, and the Bureau has published a research reports that show that these fees is ex taking a heavy, unjustified toll out of many vulnerable uh, consumers. Uh, uh, and and uh, in the past 10 years, our nation's financial institutions have drained roughly $125 billion uh, from account holders struggling day to day. Uh, Director Chopra, what under your leadership will the CFPB do to address these abusive, unfair practices and this profoundly influent, influential driver of racial inequity? So, Congresswoman, as I understand uh, the data, overdraft fees are actually disproportionately paid by um, a, a relatively small sliver of borrowers. So. Uh, some of those borrow some of those account holders are paying a very high amount of overdraft fees in a single calendar year. We will obviously enforce the law as written as well as implement any implementing regulations that have been promulgated by the the Fed or the CFPB, and we will closely monitor this market to make sure it is free of unfair and deceptive practices. Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back, and I hope you reinstate the studies that you've been doing. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and Director Chopra, thank you for appearing before us today. I look forward to hearing from you on the CFPB's actions over the past several months under the Biden administration and what your priorities uh, are as the Bureau's new director. Since the CFPB's creation, we have seen the uh, Obama administration put in place, frankly, egregious regulations that made it harder for Americans to qualify for mortgages, obtain an auto loan, and access other forms of credit that families depend on every day. Additionally, the CFPB has continually shunned due process in bringing enforcement cases against businesses and is a perfect example of how a lack of proper checks and balances lends to a downward spiral of expanded power and overreach, all at the consumer's expense. The CFPB's structure and funding mechanism must be reformed to ensure accountability to the American people. Director Chopra, do you agree that all rulemaking should be done in compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act requirements and that the public should have the opportunity to notice and comment for any major regulatory rule changes or shifts. Yes, Congresswoman, sir. yeah. The, when, whenever the CFPB seeks to promulgate a, a rule, we should always, and as, as I understand, have always complied with the Administrative Procedure Act. But if there are places where you think not that always, not compliance, I'm glad to I hear like your to commitment. Hear. No, but I would love to hear and, and happy to hear where there are places where there hasn't been, so I can look into that. Wonderful, and I appreciate your commitment to following the APA. Do you agree that the Bureau should foster a better environment for consumers by rewarding 
companies that are self-identifying and self-reporting compliance concerns, rather than seeking to punish companies and finding them when they have already taken corrective action? So uh, based on my record, I think you'll be able to see that where companies have come forward, remediated, and fixed issues, these things can be solved often without public enforcement action. Good. Um, that is a place where we, I want to encourage self-reporting. Um, but of course, um, where they have flagrantly violated the law and not taken steps to fix things, you know, enforcement action is, is usually appropriate. Just so that we're clear that self-identifying, self-reporting um, concerns, um, I, I hope that we're not going to seek to punish companies and, and find them when they've already taken, as I said, the corrective active yeah. action and done the right thing. Yes, and Congresswoman, in the law, uh, under Title 10, th that actually relates to the factors in civil penalties, assessing Correct. good faith, all of those issues. Under, under the Obama administration, we witnessed how regulation by enforcement creates uncertainty in the consumer financial markets, which in turn impacts consumers' ability to access innovative and affordable credit products. Director Chopra, will you commit the CP CFPB under your leadership to clearly communicate enforcement expectations to its supervised financial services company? That is absolutely my aspiration. I think markets work well when rules are easy to follow and easy to enforce. And I think often bright lines um, can be one play, and bans can be one way of doing it, but also we have to enforce the law as written. Um, we can't decide to invalidate parts of the law we don't like. We, you, the Congress makes the laws, and, and we have to enforce The them. uncertainty that I think has been in, um, uh, in question over time. Director Chopra, do you believe that the Bureau is accountable to Congress through your testimony today? I, that's really for you to decide about that, but I hope that all of the all of the requirements that Congress has put in place for not just the CFPB, but the OCC and others similarly situated to us, that we are adhering to high standards. Would you would you agree that the CFPB should be funded through the annual congressional appropriations process, similar to other financial regulatory agencies, to further increase the agency's accountability to Congress and the American people? So uh, again, that's really a decision for Congress, but just as a factual matter, the What's other What's your opinion banking, on it? You have an opinion on it? The other banking regulators have a similar type of independent funding, and the CFPB is subject to the appropriations process for requests above the base budget. So there are two elements of how the funding works. Uh, to date, the CFPB has not requested money above the base budget. Um, and is subject to the normal banking. My time has expired, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, who is also the chair of the House Agricultural Committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Lady. Director Shoba, let me ask you this. At the time of the CFPB civil penalty fund was established in Dodd-Frank, we in Congress ensured that in statute money, money from this fund could be used for payments for financial literacy and financial education programs. And before this hearing, I got a chance to review the CFPB's year in financial report, and I was very pleased to discover that there is now more than $576 million in unallocated funds within the CFPP's Civil Penalties Fund. Um, and so, however, while the CFP has written policies that describe the agency's role and the process for making financial allocations to consumer education, Zero, zero money has been allocated for financial education. Uh, so the question I have for you is, can you explain what factors the CFPB considers when determining the allocation 
of funds for consumer education and financial literacy programs. So Congressman, as I understand, the Civil Penalty Fund has two purposes. The primary purpose is to redress victims um, where the CFPB could not recover funds. So many defendants may be judgment proof, maybe many scammers may have taken away the money. So in those situations where the CFPB has assessed a civil penalty, the fund can be used to make those individual families whole from the, the, the funds that were illegally taken from them. The second part, as you say, can be used for certain financial literacy uh, initiatives. I'm happy to follow up and provide you. There's a set of rules um, that are in place currently to uh, de make determinations. Generally speaking, it goes through um, a process covered by certain procurement laws, but I'm happy to follow up with you with more specifics on it. But I agree that the civil penalty fund, it, it really is important to redress those victims and of course, the CFPB uses its own allocated budget to engage in, in financial education initiatives as well. Well, thank you so much for that. Let me just say that we have on this uh, financial services committee many members on both sides of the aisle who are vitally concerned and would like to see us move in a direction to allocate some of this money for financial education. That is the way we protect the consumers. We arm them with the education, with the literacy program. That's what will help us to, uh, to keep our consumers away from these predators. And so, with uh, you, as you have indicated, there is a clear linkage between the CFP's uh, ability to prevent uh, consumers from falling victim to these scams. And you, I think you also agree with many of us on this committee that we will be able, as written in the law, to be able to allocate some of this half billion dollars to educating our consumers. So with this in mind, first of all, I appreciate you extending that offer to get back with us. But Director Shobrock, can I get a real clear commitment from you today that the CFPB plans on using a portion of the more than $570 million in unallocated civil penalties funds to support financial literacy, financial education, and consumer education programs. So I, I, I totally agree with the spirit of what you're saying. I, I want to be upfront that because it also is used for victim redress, I think we should all have a discussion about what's the right allocation between victim redress and consumer education. As the chairwoman said, I wanna make sure that if people are foreclosed upon illegally and, and we need to be able to use those funds to make them whole as well. So it's, it's a balance. And but you, have, you are agreeing to work with me on this. Of course, this going of course, forward. of course. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jerry. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Chopra, last week you ordered six big technology firms to turn over information about how they collect, use, and store consumer data. Could you describe your intent in requesting this type of information? Yes, sir. So I am very, very worried, I think, as many in the regulatory uh, community have been, about big tech taking more control of the US dollar and the global flow of payments. You know, there are so many innovators who are trying to break in and they feel that big tech can just turn them off. There are so many people who feel that their data is being misused and abused. Many of us have no transparency whatsoever as to how some of these firms determine how they kick people off platforms and we have no transparency at all into a number of other issues. The orders that we have issued cover a number of topics, 
And I'm hoping that we'll be able to use that information to report to you all, because I think safeguarding our nation's payment system is so critical to our economy. It's critical to small businesses. It's critical to our national security. And I want to make sure that payment system is vibrant and serving everybody. Given your experience in this area, uh, in your view, has the growing landscape of digital payment services been a net positive uh, to consumers? Oh, uh, innovations from that heavily have been driven from mobile device adoption have been terrific for many, many businesses and consumers. The ability to be able to transfer money um, is, is more seamless than it was. But what I want to make sure is that those payment systems still adhere to consumer protection, that they don't really undermine a fast, fair, and transparent system, and that they're not squelching out innovators or kicking people off with no understanding as to why. This is an example of a mass amount of information and really insightful and critical to the developers, I suspect. So I have to ask, do you commit to remaining within the confines of the Bureau's statutory authority in relation to payments? Oh, of course. Uh, but Congressman, the, the Electronic Funds Transfer Act, the, there are Gramm-Leach-Bliley privacy rules that are under our jurisdiction. Those are deeply implicated by these payment systems. Um, when it comes to surveillance of our payments and transactions, privacy and misuse of data, um, you know, squarely in our jurisdiction. But let's not by unintention create fewer options for the consumers out there. Oh no, we want the more efficiency options. efficiency of the system. We and want more options. I respect that. A proposal for CFPB to take a role in government-run credit reporting bureau has gained support among some of my colleagues. I'm concerned that a government-run credit reporting bureau would decrease privacy and accountability. Director, do you support the creation of a government-run credit uh, reporting bureau? Uh, I'm actually... And along with that, what would you see as potential positives and negatives? So I have to be blunt with you. I have not actually given much thought to this because I don't know how mechanically it would work. Um, I know in some countries they do have that, but that would be an enormous undertaking um, that it, it, it would be a big mountain to move. I'm much more concerned in the near term, given the pandemic, about law violations of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, how the credit reporting agencies are investigating disputes, and to make sure that new types of credit reporting agencies are adhering to the law, because there are serious privacy implications of how our data is being trafficked without our knowledge. Director, it's important for financial institutions to be able to collect and close out on previous loans, which allows them the opportunity to have the resources to continue to extend credit to those who need it. Would you describe what the economic impact would be if the ability for small business and lenders to recover debts uh, were restricted? Uh, I, I, if I am understanding the question correctly, Credit reporting obviously can play a very important role in the financial ecosystem and be beneficial. Where there are severe errors and inaccuracies, that can be huge pain points for a business or a consumer to be able to move forward with their financial life. So I, I, if you're asking whether I think we should delete everyone's credit report, the answer is no. But we want to make sure credit reporting is adhering to all aspects of the law, including the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I thank you, Mr. Director, for appearing today. I greatly appreciate the fact that uh, seem to take an interest in being our consumers in ways that uh, quite frankly are beneficial to consumers. Uh, so Director, I recently introduced H.R. 5484, the Financial Compensation for CFPB Whistleblowers Act. I did this to create at the Bureau Whistleblower Protection Program model on the one created by Dodd-Frank 
at the Securities and Exchange Commission. As Facebook and uh, its whistleblower have currently made headlines and remind us that insiders are uniquely positioned to bring large scale corporate wrongs into the light, I'd like to know what do you think about the notion of this type of action taking place through the CFPB? Think about whistleblowers bringing these kinds of actions to the attention of the CFPB so as to timely report fraud, abuse, and other corporate misconduct. So, Congressman, I, I have to say I do believe in um, the power of whistleblowers, particularly when reporting this type of fraud. Um, you know, Director Craninger, my predecessor, I believe, put forth a proposal around whistleblowers as well. Um, obviously, we will have our policy differences, but this is an area where more whistleblowers um, will lead to better enforcement, a reduction of fraud. Um, I think the SEC's model is one, but I'm happy to work with you in your office to figure out how we can create um, an appropriate CFPB whistleblower program. Well, thank you for that comment. Uh, I would take it that you are somewhat familiar with the SEC's model. Uh, can you tell me how uh, that model is beneficial or some of the positives associated with it, please? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, as I understand, there have been a number of very severe deficiencies of law, uh, severe law breaking that has occurred in financial institutions that were often alerted to authorities um, by employees or by those with direct knowledge. Um, the, these whistleblower laws can, in some circumstances, depending on how it's crafted, provide protections for those individuals and also financial compensation. Um, we do know that the United States has actually recovered quite a bit of money when it comes to Medicare fraud uh, based on these whistleblower programs. Um, and I think it's something that can be very beneficial to enforcement. And uh, what about stronger protections? Uh, do you think they are needed this time uh, for misconduct such that uh, persons can report this to the CFPB to get uh, some sort of redress? And I apologize, sir, maybe just the uh, uh, your mask or the video, but stronger protections for what specifically? I apologize, I couldn't hear. Uh, do you think stronger protections are needed in the law for persons who report misconduct to the CFPB? Uh, I would need to get back to you with more specifics on that, but we want to make sure that, uh, like other agencies, whistleblowers are not retaliated against or have the ability to provide information um, and are safe in doing so. I will look forward to working with you. You've indicated a willingness to do so. I'd like to work with you so that we can uh, present a uh, bill you know, that I'm in favor with you as well as we're trying to accomplish here in Congress. I've always found it beneficial to be aligned with the agency that is trying to, that we'll have to implement. I'm happy to do so. So thank you very much. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is now recognized for five minutes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Director, thank you for taking time to be with the committee uh, this morning. Uh, we do appreciate your time and respect uh, the role that you have. Mr. Director, uh, you're engaged in now rulemaking uh, procedures and uh, that would be about what is called Section 1071 which is known as the Small Business Lending Data Collection. And this is important to, uh, it was important to us when Dodd-Frank was passed, and it has two overwhelming, really, reasons of what this is about, intended to do. Facilitating uh, enforcement, in other words, giving an opportunity for the data collection to match up with what enforcement so you can see it. And sec secondly, enabling opportunities for people. Would you mind taking a minute and giving us your viewpoint of this uh, small business lending data collection rule that you're preparing and giving us some parameters about how those people that collect the data, lenders, 
might might gain some access uh, of knowledge that you're thinking. Yeah, I, th thanks for this question. So the CFPB has proposed, before I arrive, proposed a rule to implement those requirements. I I'll tell you, I think um, the public was at a disadvantage during the pandemic, including with respect to the PPP program by not having reliable small business data available. There are many good reasons to have that small business data, um, including to understand a complete picture of how our small businesses are accessing financing, but also how we can determine um, trends, spot risks, and avoid discrimination. So I do wanna uh, encourage everyone to submit comments to this because I think like the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act database, there will actually be um, certain data that may be publicly available that can be useful to local officials, to the small business community, to financial institutions and others. So I I'm eager to work with everybody to make sure we get this right and implement it according um, to the, the deadline established by the court. Director, thank you very much. Uh, I think that my, my feedback to you would be is that- My name's grabbing the congressman's phone so he's able to vote. I'm sorry, I did not hear that. Uh, that, that wasn't me, sir. <laughs> okay, uh, Director, it, my, my personal feedback is, is that I hope we take this and the rulemaking would be a part of this as data and information that would enable us to do the two things that are their reasons instead of it being used as a weapon. I think that data like this needs an opportunity to be vetted and us understand the, the type of information that also could have changed dramatically from the time a loan was taken out. And as you know, during the last few years, a lot of money was rushed to small businesses without the rules in place and the knowledge of those rules and how that data and information may have been gathered. And then material pieces of the business and the loan may have changed dramatically as a result of COVID. So it's my hope that we would use this as a tool, as an opportunity to gain more information and work with and learn how CFPB would want to use this data, working with the industry, but not the weapon. I agree and with you, sir. Hope. I agree with you. Great. That's, that's my whole point. And I will look forward to uh, following up with you. And you may count on me as someone who would want to be uh, interested in this issue, and thank you for your time. Madam Chairman, I yield back my time with the with the choice here that I would like to add that I think the director was very clear and gave us a, a, a good answer, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and again, Mr. Chopra, it's, it's good to have you here. Uh, just one thought from my point of view, from my perspective, and Mr. Heisinga and I, uh, a number of years ago, had an issue where a title company in Michigan uh, had the roof brought down on them. Uh, it was a $500,000 fine uh, brought really out of nowhere, it, it seemed like that way to me. And so I just like to reiterate, um, you know, in terms of just bringing the enforcement bludgeon, that there be an effort, um, and this is an anecdote, it doesn't happen all the time, but I think from my point of view, I wanna make sure that we have good regulations in place, that you are following them and you are giving uh, businesses who might be under your jurisdiction an opportunity to correct whatever mistakes that they have made. Uh, can you give me sort of yeah, your philosophy I, on this? Yes, th this a, uh, I've thought about this issue a lot. I think one of the things that drives me a little crazy is when federal agencies don't focus their efforts on nationwide or systemic or severe harm. And instead, um, I saw this at the FTC. On one hand, the FTC is letting Facebook and Google off the hook. On the other hand, ch you know, chasing after small businesses, many of them you know, with, with questionable, strong-arming them into settlements, I believe that we should focus 
most of our resources on the largest firms that are engaged in nationwide harm that are really, um, you know, totally beyond the pale, where they should, where they clearly knew what the rules were often, where they clearly knew what they were doing, or they, you know, buried their head in the sand. Focusing on larger participants in the market, I think, is one of the best ways we can accomplish our mission. I don't know about the specific case you mentioned, and it, in fact, I don't know the facts. It may have been very severe. I just don't know. But that is generally my philosophy. And I think what we saw over the past many years under both Democrats and Republicans um, of failures at the FTC, I don't, I don't want to repeat that at the CFPB. Okay. No, thank you. I appreciate your sharing that. Um, let me change a little bit to the, to the big platforms, since you just mentioned some of them. In terms of, you know, 1033 and Dodd-Frank and the ability for the CFPB to kind of keep an eye on transparency, keep an eye on fairness, uh, you, you talked about getting kicked off a platform, a payment platform or the like. Explain to us what you're, what you're talking about and, and if you want to name names, I'm okay with that too. Well, a payment system that is that works well is one that is open, resilient, and fast. And I think there are questions. We've seen it in the App Store context. We've seen it in other types of platforms. How are they making decisions about who they include and who they kick off, and how are they deciding on how much to charge them? I'm worried that some of these big tech platforms may start competing businesses and therefore want to foreclose potential competitors, that's bad for consumers, that's bad for businesses, and we need to understand those policies. In many cases, of course, if someone is being, it has red flags related to money laundering, if people are not eligible for other specified reasons, that may be totally appropriate. But when payment networks may be using their own business incentives to kick off consumers or businesses, we, need to, we should know why. Okay. Um, in the rulemaking process, in terms of this data, you know, understanding the data and how these platforms are working, can you share where you are in the rulemaking process? So with, uh, you're referring to Section 1033, yes. which um, is about consumer control of data. Um, as I understand it, last year there was an issuance of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, there has been comment collected on that. I'm very eager to engage on what we know so far, because I think Section 1033 holds promise to um, really make sure there's a more competitive environment and that consumers have more choices and that there's not just a handful of incumbents who control everything. Competition is good here. At the same time, we're going to need to make sure we're protecting privacy, security, and other things that um, are, are critical. So there's a lot of issues, and, and we're very much eager to hear from everybody on this um, as we think through um, th this this tool that Congress has has put into place. Thank you, sir. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Waters, for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Chopa, over several Congresses, I've introduced legislation to direct the CFPB to permit regulated entities to ask the CFPB to resolve uncertainties in the interpretation of regulations and statutes by the advisory opinions available. In more recent years, I asked the previous director, Ms. Kranger, to implement an advisory opinion program administratively, and I'm very grateful that she did do that. Uh, in more just wonder if you can give us an update on the status of the program for advisory opinions and how it's being used, uh, the applications and results you've obtained so far, and how you might plan to expand or improve the program as we go down the road. Yes, sir. So um, yeah. I think I'm, I may only be on day 12 or 13 of the job, so I, I don't have all the exact information, which I apologize, but just so you know my views... Yes. Um, I do believe there is a role um, for, as you mentioned, the interpretive rules, advisory opinions, and others um, to be able to develop the law. Um, in many cases, that is helpful to everybody. At the same time, I want to be upfront that I don't think the CFPB should be picking winners and losers. 
um, you know, crowning an individual company uh, to be able to own a market. I think we are better off when we can go through the rulemaking process, go through interpretive rules, guidance, advisory opinions in ways that everybody can understand and not just one individual just firm one that individual. It, it, you know, is seeking it. Well, <clears throat> for example, if you say they have to paint the office furniture red, there's a lot of variations of the color red. And somebody might want to ask for the benefit of many, what particular color code are you talking about? I, t I totally agree with you. I think that the more that this can be elucidated, and I think generally speaking, I prefer, um, you know, pretty clear, easy to understand, easy to follow, easy to enforce rules, but where, you know, of course we have inherited the CFPB, an enormous number of rules from the Federal Reserve Board, many of them are so complicated. And uh, yes, there are places where uh, I hear exactly what you're saying. It can be the benefit for everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. In March 2021, the CFPB noticed a rule change to postpone the compliance date for the new QM rule to October 1st, 2022. Uh, does your postponement reflect a change in policy direction uh, from the December 2020 rule that would replace QM loan definitions 43% limit on debt to income uh, with a price-based approach, or is there some other explanation for the postponement? So, sir, uh, obviously that was before me, but as I understand, um, the new definitions from the uh, you know general QM rule, they have taken effect. The thing that was the aspect that was delayed was the mandatory compliance date. So. Lenders can use one of multiple definitions, and as I understand from the Federal Register notice, that it was because there was dislocations and potential disruptions in the mortgage market during the time of the pandemic, and the goal was actually to create more certainty for lenders, or at least more flexibility for lenders on the mechanisms that they could comply with that rule in order to continue to extend mortgage credit. You know, with respect to the QM writ large, I'm always eager to hear of places where um, it needs to be changed. But as a, I want to be clear, though, that the rule has taken effect. Okay. Well, I, I, I thank you for your responses. I thank you for your appearing here. And, and I see my time is about to expire, so I'll yield back to balance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Director. So good to see you. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm really happy to see you because I believe you know, I've been here for a while and I know when uh, we created the uh, Consumer Protection uh, Financial Protection, it was for consumers. Never had anything before for consumers. And <laughs> Somewhere in the last few years, we've lost our way that we were not focused on consumers. And so it's good to see you and listening to you that we're back to focus on consumers again. So, you know, the Dodd-Frank Act gave the CFPB the authority under Section 1033 to promulgate a rule that would allow consumers full electronic access to their financial data. There's a growing need and desire for the concept of open finance. With that, Open finance marketplaces are offering greater competition to financial services and products. So my question to you is, will you prioritize CBCF's, CFPB, excuse me, Section 1033 rulemaking? And can you provide any insight into how you're going to balance the continued data access for hundreds of millions of Americans who use fintechs every day and the need for consumer protections in the financial data access space? I appreciate the question, uh, Congressman. So let me just say as a, as a general matter, Congress has made it clear to the CFPB we need to make sure that markets are fair, transparent, and competitive. And a competitive market means that consumers aren't locked in to a product that they you know, want to get out of or that they want to get a lower price on or want to get a, a better service on. So Section 1033, I think aspirationally could unlock more competition, 
could unlock more opportunities. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that banks and non-banks are operating under the same set of rules, mm -hmm. that there's not regulatory arbitrage. So we're gonna be looking at all these issues. I will tell you, I have um, studied a bit the United Kingdom's open banking system, um, as well as what other jurisdictions have done to create more consumer control of data um, and how we can harness technologies to do it. And, and I'm very interested in seeing what we can do there. Um, I don't know any timelines or anything more, again, only on I think day 12 or 13 of the job, but, but very, very interested in what we can unlock for businesses, consumers alike. Well, Craig, I know it's only day 12, 13, but as I said, there's high expectations that we've got you and you'll be focused on, on um, consumers. The pandemic has also highlighted that the impact that access to credit has on particularly women and minority-owned businesses, uh, and there's a tremendous need to increase that access. And it seems to me clear that under the Biden administration, the CFPB is putting financial inclusion and racial equality at the forefront. And of course, for that, you know, I want to commend you and your colleagues. Earlier uh, last month, the CFPB issued a proposed rule under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act that would require covered financial institutions to report small business lending data and annual reports on small businesses uh, and the credit application. So, can you please explain how the CFPB expects to use its in use its enforcement authority? under the ECOA and how the data that it will collect will further advance these initiatives for women and minority-owned businesses. Congressman, I'm, I'm reminded, I, I believe in 2013 or 2014, you invited me to Jamaica to have a town hall with you and, and this issue actually came up there. Absolutely. No one, people not being able to find help or not knowing where to turn um, and not necessarily having access because they did, there was not a sense of relationship banking locally. And I think we need to restore that and make sure that we, our markets are free of discrimination. I think the rulemaking you referred to um, will give the CFPB insight into whether there is any discriminatory patterns, but also macro data on what communities are being served well when it comes to small business loans. Um, in many ways, it is similar to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data collection on mortgages, but there's some important differences. But I think if we want a vibrant, growing economy across the country, regardless of neighborhood, regardless of, of race or ethnicity, we want to make sure small business and entrepreneurship is in people's sights and that they can access the capital to do so. Thank you. My time has expired. I'm excited to work with you, though. Excited you're there. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Right. And uh, I, I know he's uh, left, but my colleague from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, brought up uh, something that was very important. And uh, I know you may not know the details of the case, but um, to, uh, to round it out a little bit, it was a small title company. Uh, that, uh, that was put uh, in the crosshairs of the CFPB uh, to be made an example of to the larger companies. And at best, uh, th well, let me put it this way, at worst, their actions were in a gray area, at worst. Uh, and they literally were put, uh, put in the crosshairs and uh, levied a fine that would have bankrupted them. And, uh, when I could not even receive a return phone call, I went to my friend and colleague across the aisle, uh, who then on my behalf called and started getting some answers and had me be a part of that. And I'm forever grateful for him, and I hopefully have tried to re repay that, uh, that kindness. But uh, I, I want to just reinstate, make sure I heard what I think I heard, which is that is not your philosophy to, to pound on a little guy to make sure that the message gets sent to these larger operators. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And I want to be clear, though, that doesn't mean small businesses and medium-sized businesses should not follow the law. Correct. But it's that what the federal government should be focused on, us particularly, going after the biggest harms in the market 
and rather than kind of picking on people. Yep. I saw this at the FTC. I was constantly distressed about the bullying of small businesses rather than willing to take the big companies to court yeah. who are well resourced to do well, it, it was it's really regulation through enforcement and uh, and I and I'm glad to hear that that isn't uh, isn't the case and and as I said in this particular uh, situation um, it was a shift in policy from the CFPB that was not a legislative shift and uh, it was uh, at, like I said at worst a gray area but they decided to make an example of that um, so moving on, um, I, I am kind of curious, though, and concerned uh, whether you would agree with this notion that having wild swings in, in policy coming out of the CFPB or any regulator uh, could actually cause harm not to the company, but by extension, the consumer that that company is, is trying, to, uh, trying to serve. And, and I just want to know if you understand those challenges implementing uh, pretty severe and, and, and wide uh, uh, rule changings and swings in policy, what that might do. Yeah, I think what, where we are is we always want to make sure that um, obviously the policies represent those that Congress has put into place and administer those laws, but I completely appreciate, particularly for our small businesses, being able to understand what they need to do to comply um, and that they spending less time hiring lawyers and all these things and focusing on their business. So it can really divert resources, basically, that are that should be going to service the. Yeah, and the customer. And, and as you know, the law, many lawyers want to put money in their own pockets by creating hysteria and creating uncertainties, and so it's important for the regulator to also be clear on on what the rules are wherever we can when we are implementing the laws you Great. pass. And this one might be a little outside your lane, but it dovetails with something that I asked uh, 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 Chairman Ginsler. You happen to bring up large tech companies and uh, lots of concerns, I think, on both sides of the aisle about this. I'd like to know, when do you think that a service provider might actually morph into becoming a utility and then has a different, possibly a different set of regulations on that. So just give me a little of your philosophy on what you think, um, uh, and it doesn't, it probably is most applicable with tech firms at this point, but when do these tech firms get to be so big and powerful and direct, because you talked about yeah. them setting up competition to put others out of business. When do those companies become utilities in your mind? Yeah, so, uh Historically, we have a number of different frameworks for this. Um, the Communications Act, the uh, you know railroad regulations. I think the way our country has dealt with it is one of two ways. I think antitrust, sort of breaking up firms and making sure that they're not monopolies or abusing it, or utility-style regulation where there is a natural monopoly, um, you know, like the electric electric company or whatever it might be. So. Uh, it, you're right, it's a little bit distant from the laws that I'm administering, but I think that is something that there are many places, um, and this is something Chair Lena Khan at the FTC has, has described before about ways in which policymakers can approach these issues. The Communications Act obviously has a number of vehicles in which this is done, but again, some of this is a little distant from. But you will be enforcing some of those concerns, uh, presumably, as as those companies. Yeah, that's right. And I will say that there are a number of, of, of firms that have a huge amount of power in the financial ecosystem. Um, there's, you know, very few credit bureaus. There are almost everyone uses the FICO score. Um, so, you know, we have to figure out how to make sure that they're fair, transparent, and competitive, of course. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Drill Development, and Insurance is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Director, congratulations. Um, and we certainly look forward to working with you. I'm going to try to squeeze three questions in. Uh, if possible. And uh, on um, Tuesday, uh, CNBC reported that MasterCard is uh, preparing to announce that uh, any of the thousands of banks and millions of merchants on its uh, payment net network uh, will be able to integrate crypto into their products. 
Um, every time I see one of these statements, I, it caused me to tremble a little bit uh, because I'm not sure we have, con have successfully dealt with the whole issue of double spending uh, of Bitcoins and you know, spending the, 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 uh, the balance more than, than once, which you couldn't do if you had a dollar. Uh, but the, the capitalization, uh, I was with Mr. Meeks in New York at one of these uh, tech companies and uh, they talked about the capitalization is now at about 2.6 trillion with a T dollars. Uh, does that create any nervousness on your part or do you think we have everything under control based on dollar Frank? Uh, so with respect to um, Bitcoin and the stable coin, um, this is something Secretary Yellen and, and Chair Powell and all of the regulators um, have started to discuss some of the risks that involve systemic risks. Obviously, uh, there may be risk to investors or consumers. So um, there is um, a great deal of interagency discussion about how to approach this problem. Because what, what we do, not, I think in many ways, Facebook's Libra proposal in 2019 was a wake up call to all of us about really what could be the damage that is done to our dollar and to really our, our economy and our household. So I think it's really all, for all of us to be working with and really to be working with all of you too, because this is something we need to make sure that fast, pay, fast seamless payments have so many benefits, but we need to make sure um, we're guarding against risks as well. Well, it, 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 in that regard, uh, are there things that you would recommend to us uh, that we should legislatively uh, pursue in order to reduce uh, the threats uh, that we can experience, not just you know here at home with MasterCard, but internationally, uh, the hoodlum governments, uh, you know, would love to be able to, to uh, create problems for us uh, in this area. Yeah, yeah, Congressman Cleaver, I know you and I have had a lot of discussions about small business loans, student loans, and I think this is a new one where there are uncertain risks and we need to get, get down to the bottom of it. All of the banking regulators and securities regulators, I'm very happy to continue to work with you on that. I don't have any recommendations off the top of my head, but I think we all need to make sure that we are protecting our payment systems and flow of currency. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I, I, I try not to be a, a Crow Magna or troglodytic in my attitudes about this new technology uh, it does create some fright. Uh, but uh, the, the, the issue is, 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 is so serious t to me uh, that, that, we, that we may need to uh, you know, have, have ongoing dialogue, uh, as you just suggested, to make sure that we um, are, are on top of, of, of the issues that could be born out of this uh, amazing uh, new technology. Um, uh, if this, ex if, what, you may not even be able to deal with this, if MasterCard can go this direction, what if all of, I mean, what happens if we have a flood of institutions, lending institutions going into this arena uh, like this, what, I mean, yeah, so I think that's really something to watch out for with respect to um, you know the stable coin. Stable coins are right now primarily used for speculative purposes, but one could imagine that if it starts riding the rails of some of the large networks or big tech companies, it could scale very, very quickly. Um, and so that is something that, and I apologize, I don't have all the answers for you on that, but I'm attuned to really where some of the uh, places we need to analyze, collect data. That's part of the reason that I issued those orders to the big tech companies so that that may be a place where certain digital currencies scale very, very quickly and globally in ways that we may not fully understand the implications of. Well, again, congratulations and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Director Chopra, good to see you. Congratulations on your appointment. Great to see you again. And I look forward to working with you during your tenure 
uh, to promote consumer protection, not from a heavy-handed central planning approach, but instead, as you describe, a competitive marketplace where consumers uh, retain access to choices. And I was encouraged to hear you say uh, that you want to restore relationship banking. That was really, really a, a positive comment in your prepared testimony uh, in the way I think of it. And in fact, I think you used the words cut through red tape. And I'm going to hold you to that uh, because I believe relationship banking and relationship lending can't happen when lenders are deterred by a regulation through enforcement approach. Uh, so first question, do you believe that regulated entities should know the rules of the road in advance of any supervision or enforcement action? Yes, the laws that you have passed, um, we should make sure that do our best so that everyone knows what they are. I believe that we work best when laws are clear, easy to follow, easy to uh, enforce. Right, and I think that will facilitate that relationship style of lending. Let's talk about UDAP and um, your predecessor, actor, acting director uh, Weegio's rescission of the Kraninger uh, policy statement from 2020. And, and I appreciated what you said about durability and a durable abusive jurisprudence, but you also, in an answer to my colleague's question, talked about how the Bureau could provide some durability through uh, through um, uh, in, in interpreting or applying uh, the abusiveness standard. And, he, and here's where I, I think where your, your immediate predecessor went wrong on rescinding, rescinding the guidance, because I, I don't believe rescinding uh, the Bureau's guidance promoted durability. I think it was the opposite. It created a chaotic discontinuity uh, and unpredictability, and 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 I think um, um, arguably it was arbitrary and capricious to just upend abruptly um, a, a a guidance offered by uh, Director Kraninger. So my question to you is: Given the fact that Acting Director Weigio did not, in his rescission, did not offer an alternative interpretation of abusive, what in your mind is the the in, the correct definition of abusive? So. Uh, many questions there. I'll try my best and t tell me if I don't. So with respect to abusive, Congress has laid out what the definition is in the multi-prong approach. So that exists, that's the law, and that is enforceable not just by the CFPB, the Prudential Banking Regulators, but also state attorneys general. Right, but Kraninger defined it. The problem, market participants didn't have clarity on what the statutory language actually meant, and that's why there was this dual pleading position in there, and so let's get a little so bit more. Congressman, can I just say More that specific. On, on this, on this, uh, that statement was not binding on, this, on the state attorneys general. It was not binding on the state regulators. It was not binding on the other. So, so let's get to that durability piece. So, yeah, so the way, the way in which, I think the way you build jurisprudence, there's many, many ways you do that, but particularly you raise the issue of dual pleading. Right. When an when agency finds a violation of law and doesn't plead it, that's actually abrogating what Congress directed, and it's also bad for the development. Okay, so of the what's law. the difference in your mind between abusive and unfair? So, unfairness and abusive are two different frameworks. Unfairness requires an analysis of substantial injury, it requires an analysis of avoidability and it also requires okay. an analysis of countervailing benefits to consumers okay. and competition. In, in the interest of time, because we only have five minutes, I would have also asked you what's the difference between uh, abusive and deceptive. But the point here is that in the Kraninger policy statement, uh, she specifically said that the Bureau would avoid challenging conduct of abusive where the alleged violation relied on all or nearly the same facts as an unfairness or decept deception violation. This is exactly what you're saying. You're making distinctions between the two. Kraninger was clarifying that why is the rescission, uh, the acting acting director Weijio's uh, rescission, in any way clarifying the situation? So I think sir, the rescission is undermining durability here. I totally disagree respectfully okay. with you. When we when we don't plead those, courts cannot analyze that. They cannot issue opinions to determine whether whether the the conduct at hand violates. I'm running out so of time. Let's I work together on durability. Eager. I'm very eager to create a durable... Uh, running out of time, yeah. let's work together on that. On civil investigative demands, are you open to guardrails on the factual predicates to initiate a CID and other parameters? A lot of uh, uh, regulated parties feel that this is a fishing expedition. 
I want to know how your agency and your leadership intends to, to put guardrails on, on CID so it's not a fishing expedition. I'm, I'm happy to review the existing policies on the issuance of civil investigative demand. While I was commissioner, I closely reviewed them and often um, you know, asked that changes be made to them. So I, I'll look at that. I'll, I take that feedback. Look forward to working with you. Okay. Thanks. Yield back. The gentleman, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, who is also the chair of the task force on artificial intelligence, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations, Director Chopra. Uh, so as you take the reins at the CFPB, you're going to have to generate a workforce plan, and particularly in the area of a high-tech workforce plan to deal with AI and related issues. And this is going to be particularly <coughs> important in the context of the ongoing merger and blurring of the lines between financial services and big tech. Uh, as was just pointed out, Chair Waters has impaneled a task force on AI, which I'm uh, chairing together with Ranking Member Gonzalez. And, um, yeah. and so now on this whole issue, we're going to have to skate to where the puck is going here uh, because this, this transformation will happen over the coming decade. If current trends persist, soon the great majority of financial services transactions are going to be marketed and transacted online. And actually, if Mark Zuckerberg's dreams come true, in a decade, we are all going to be wandering around in the metaverse where we will encounter some AI avatar who is, in fact, a non-fiduciary robo-advisor. And he will be using all of Facebook's psychological profiles that they've worked up on us to figure out exactly what to say to us to gain our confidence so that they can sell us you know, overpriced life insurance or crummy investment products. You know, not too different than, than um, the abuses we see in the human area. Um, and now, to defend the consumer against this sort of potential abuse, you are going to need a CFPB workforce that is not overmatched against the tech companies. Um, and so that means competitive salaries, among other things. So what are your thoughts on how you're going to do this, and what is there that Congress can help you uh, make this, standing up this workforce easier? So I appreciate that, Congressman. And, and one of the things I did immediately was I appointed a chief technologist of the Bureau. Um, I appointed Erie Meyer, who has served at several federal agencies and has worked closely with me in the past on identifying technological talent that can enter public service so that it's not just lawyers trying to figure all of this out, but actual uh, individuals with real experience and not just engineering, but a whole host of, ish of skills related to technology I think one of the things that we should just understand as reality is that unless we can understand the technology that is being used, we won't be able to effectively police it. And we're never going to have the resources of the big tech companies. We're never going to have the resources of the big banks. We're never going to have the big resources of the, the credit bureaus. But we need to make sure we have the skill sets in-house so that when new products and new markets are shifting, we actually have a data-driven way of looking at that problem and that we're looking at the right set of interventions. You know, when I, when I see the problems in mortgage servicing that the chairwoman had mentioned, a lot of those problems were also related to lousy software and, and decisions that mortgage servicing companies a decade ago did not take to upgrade that software. The Equifax data breach was an absolute disgrace. And because the regulators, I think, need to make sure that they're understanding how data is guarded, data is protected, um, all of those are places that the workforce, of course, across federal agencies are gonna need to evolve. It's an area where I've discussed with the states, with uh, our counterparts in Europe as well, and it's an imperative for our country to be competitive. Yeah, and well, you know, Congress has understood that there is a need for Oh, I guess a lot of people have already complained about uh, Dr. Fauci's salary being higher than members of Congress. And that is actually okay with us because of the extreme importance to have of having, you know, a certain number of really highly skilled jobs uh, that are paid competitive salaries to the private sector. And this is a very tough uh, conversation to have when you're managing a mixed workforce of, of you know, traditional scheduled federal employees and, and others. So what is your... Um, yeah, so what are the what, what are the challenges there 
Uh, do, you, do you find that there are a significant number of people who made their careers and their fortunes in Silicon Valley companies that are really willing to come and spend several years? Or is that really not enough and we're gonna to have to do something on the salary yeah, side? Yeah, it's a great question. So the experience I think in some places has been, yes, there may be people who have, you know, very financially comfortable, willing to serve. Of course, at the same time, we have to guard against conflicts of interest, yeah. though they may have very substantial stock holdings. I think what you see um, in the financial regulatory agencies is many, especially the lawyers, they go through the revolving door and make huge amounts of money on the other end. And we're not gonna be able to you know, pay them the same, but I think what we wanna be able to do is offer um, a real good value proposition on how they can serve the public, serve Congress, um, and serve the future of our markets. Um, and you know, the goal is to be able to recruit those people with that in mind, but of course you're right, on the margins, um, you know, Yep. Well, when you figure all this stuff out, let me know. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then my time's up. Yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, earlier, uh, my colleague Perlmutter called you a champion for small business. We got something in common. I'm a champion for small business. Uh, and before we get started, I, I got to say, I'm a, small, I'm a small business owner in Texas, but before we get started, I got to tell you in the past, uh, your agency, every, every way it turned costs jobs on Main Street America. And you can't, you can't have competition and you can't help Main Street America by adding regulations on top of regulations. Now, businesses need to know the rules of the road. We have talked about that this morning before they hit they're hit with arbitrary enforcement actions. And under Director Cordry's supervision, the CFPB had an awful track record of issuing massive fines and penalties. We've heard about that today for things that have never previously been deemed harmful to consumers. And I'm very concerned that this practice of regulation through enforcement, we will once again come back under, uh, under this new leadership, your leadership, and it will force market participants out of the marketplace, more jobs. And we're already seeing this trend in the student loan service uh, servicer space in the CFPB's own report from the student loans uh, ombudsman. It states four of the nine federal student loan ser servicers have either stopped or announced that they are going to stop serving federal student loans. <coughs> this will require the largest transfer of student loan uh, over 16 million borrowers with a loan volume of over 650 billion it's the largest in the history of higher education and presents heightened risk of borrower harm. So it will be impossible for a business to create a regulatory compliance system if they're unaware of what they're even going to avoid or what they're expected. Uh, Director uh, Shopri, do you understand that the uncertainty coming out of your agency is causing businesses to drastically change their practices in a way that limits competition? And we, you've talked about you want competition and will ultimately uh, harm consumers. Yeah, so s since the about 1982 or three, we've seen small businesses as a proportion of total firms in the economy go on a constant decline. And there's a host of reasons for that, and I always wanna figure out what is it that we can do to make sure that people can challenge the big guys, that they can enter, You've raised the issue of regulation. I, it's part of the reason why I believe that, you know, we always want to aspire for laws, regulations to be easy to enforce, easy to understand. But at the same time, I do want to be upfront with you that I think, m based on my conversations with many in venture capital and others, a big reason people don't want to enter is that they think they're going to get squashed by the big guys, that they have so little ability to be able to compete, and particularly when it comes to small financial institutions, ones that do offer relationship banking, they have a tough time doing it. And I think we need to really look at that to see what are those barriers that they face. And I take your feedback seriously about what you see as them, but I think there's a, a, a story there that we have to actually conquer together. Small business is, 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 is what generates our economy, and we all know that. There are many rulemakings the CFPB is undertaking that have banks and Main Street America very concerned. One of the proposals is the 1071 data collection regime that will force banks uh, to report uh, 
demographic data on all small business loans. It, this proposed rule is 918 pages long, is a nightmare for anyone that is going to be forced to comply. Some of the most laughable provisions in this uh, terrible rule are that, that lenders will be forced to guess a loan applicant race and ethnicity based on the borrower's appearance and last name if they leave that information blank. Now, this will force loan officers to racially profile every applicant. Now, I'm old enough, very few in here remember the 60s. I was in business in the 60s, and uh, we, we couldn't ask those questions. They took those questions away because it was racist. Now, here we are back doing, doing the very same thing. So small businesses would be forced to have significant amounts of information on their business made public on CFPB's website. Many small businesses do not want metrics like gross annual revenue or the purpose of the loan to be accessible uh, to the public. So not only will this rule force sensitive information to be made public, but it would add a significant new compliance cost on financial institutions, uh, which will lead to credit becoming more expensive and less available, all in the midst of serious inflationary pressures that we see today and supply chain issues. So instead of hiring more loan officers, uh, businesses are going to have to hire more compliance officers. So quickly, uh, how will you ensure that access to credit will not be hampered under this rule and will not allow for borrowers to opt out of complying with the democratic of small, demographic of small business information requirements in order to get a loan? May I answer? Uh, so we will faithfully seek to implement the congressional directive on Section 1071. With respect to the specific issues, and I'll be quick, we really need people to file comments on this so that we can actually implement the statutory directive um, and consider all the issues you've raised, including with respect to privacy. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who's also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. Hello, Director. First, I want to thank you and your staff for uh, providing technical assistance and coordinating with us on uh, drafting the uh, bill to deal with the uh, great LIBOR problem. We now have language that I think every consumer group that's focused on uh, this is uh, at least okay with, every business group. Now uh, we've got to work out some language with the Fed since they're the ones that are actually going to have to, to do the work, but your office has been very helpful. Uh, PACE loans are well-intentioned in that they uh, help people get new air conditioning systems and other uh, that, that are energy efficient. Um, uh, in almost every instance your predecessor uh, came before uh, our committee, I asked uh, whether the CFPB was close to uh, finishing the regulations required by statute. Since spring of 2019, the Bureau has taken no action beyond issuing uh, advanced uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. Are, are you getting there? How close? So uh, as I understand, the process is ongoing. I, I just want to be upfront with you. I know it's not optional, so we're going to do it. Um, I need, I, I can Is the decade in which it's to be completed optional? That, that, that was a rhetorical question. Well, you know, for, for, for the record, uh, uh, please give me a definitive response as to when yes. the next step is going to be completed. I, yes. I don't so, want to nail you down. No, 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 no. Unless no. you want to be nailed down. No, no, no. Can you I, give me a I month? Actually, I'm happy to take a question for the record on that. Again, I'm, I think only day 12 or 13. I'm still making sure I understand what is in the record. I'm going to count on you to what? actually answer definitively for the record and move on to another Understood. question. Yes, sir. Uh, our good colleague... Uh, from Florida, Mr. Posey already asked you what the Bureau plans uh, to do on the QM rule. I'd like to follow up and ask, has the Bureau seen any market evidence or concerns uh, since April of, uh, of this year uh, when the QM patch was uh, extended, I believe, uh, that you think require another round of revisions to QM? Um, do you have concerns or...? Um... Yeah, you know, so we did have a pretty uh, very robust 12 months from July of last year to June of this year in terms of mortgage origination. I, I believe it was a record. Um, so on the other hand, it's hard to make that determination given the flux of the economy and the recovery of the pandemic. So what I've asked the staff to do is to really let me know 
what are we seeing in some of the more specific borrower segments and geographies so that we can identify what's going on? And, and sir, as you know, Treasury and the FHFA have changed the, the, the preferred share agreement. So obviously there's some changes in the housing capital markets as well that is dictated by factors outside of the QM rule. But of course, QM is a key part of the mortgage market and the mortgage regulatory um, guidelines. So I wanna make sure that we're always looking at it to see whatever we can do to make sure we're promoting the objectives that Congress laid forward in Dodd-Frank with that, with, on that front. Wanna move on to another question and that is, Consumers are tricked into wiring usually the down payment of the ho on their house, which they've saved their whole life for, to the wrong account. Um, <clears throat> they're told that's the account of the escrow agent of the title company because somebody went phishing and hacking and I sent see. them an email that looks like that. The reason they get away with this is because we don't have a system where you identify the person that you're, or, or company you're sending the money to, just the number. So if you can convince them that Acme es escrow company is number one, two, three, four, five, and that's really the account of a Nigerian prince, then your money is going to support royalty in Nigeria. Um, I pushed Chairman Powell on this. This week I've pushed uh, Governor uh, uh, Brainard uh, over on the Fed. It's their system, but it's your job to protect consumers. Uh, can you work with us to get a system like they have in Britain so that uh, when you wire money, you wire money to name of person or company you're wiring money to and the, um, uh, the, the account number? Yeah, so as I understand, um, the standards in which wiring, it uses the SWIFT code plus some, but, but as you say, it doesn't require an identifier Right. or a specific name. So I'm very happy to discuss this further with other parts of the Federal Reserve System. I, I take seriously we are there to protect consumers, but the, but the systemic answer may be in fact. You're the one with the mission. Yes. Thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you for holding the hearing, and congratulations, Director. We're glad to have you before us today and your oversight responsibility. And uh, just a, a quick note, I would say having been in community banking for really on and off for 40 years, uh, I have to take a little issue that it's not big bank competition. I really don't think that's the case. I think it really is the overhead cost as a percentage of assets that is a real detriment to bank formation and uh, smaller banks being successful and competitive on an ROE and RO basis. And to Mr. Williams' point, a lot of that is in the detailed level of compliance and how it's even grown more dense for banks. Uh, and so really banks under uh, $1 billion, I think, really do struggle with that. So keep that in mind as you refer and look at uh, your work. And in that regard, I assume you believe that the Administrative Procedures Act, the APA, is the best way for a regulatory agency to communicate with the broad public on a proposal. Is that your view? To communicate? Yeah, communicate and ask for comment oh, and yeah. actually so, so, outline your legal proposals. Yeah. So, so uh, I, don't, I don't know, I'd characterize best, it's the law. So we have to use the Administrative Procedure Act to so you, promulgate so, regulations and it provides for notices, a comment period. Yeah, and, I know what it yeah. provides, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you're supportive of it. And, and likewise, do you think that regulatory agencies should do a cost benefit analysis to all the parties involved before a proposal becomes a final rule? So in the Dodd-Frank Act, the uh, agency is required to consider um, certain issues related to benefits, costs, other things. So. We, we will follow what the statute requires. Thank you for that. So on the uh, subject of the QM rule, I've, I listened to Mr. Posey and now uh, my friend from California, Mr. Sherman, and I don't know that either got the kind of answer they're looking for after you, so I'm gonna go for three strikes uh, here with you. In the postponement, which was, as you say, delivered due to the pandemic. We have had a robust housing market. We've had a record number of closings. I don't see in your complaint data any spike in complaints. 
My question for you is real simple. Do you support the proposed change in the QM rule that was proposed by the CFPB after hours and weeks and years of work with the stakeholders? I don't know, but I'll take a question for the record on that. I wanna make sure I understand the full basis of it, but I just wanna be clear, that rule has gone into effect yeah, that is now a way that people can comply. And they have and an option. They have an. I just want to know if you if you think it's a, a good compromise. It was hard to get to where we were. They have an option now, but that creates uncertainty in the market, or it certainly could, and it creates programming uncertainty for IT professionals for banks. So I think we ought to not postpone it anymore and move forward. And I'd like uh, I will ask you on that in the record. And Please. Madam Chair, I'd like to submit a letter to the record from the coalition dated September of 2019 expressing their strong views. Without objection, coalition. such is the order. I appreciate and, it. Sir, oh, sorry. If I sir? can just Yeah, add, please. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I'm, also, I'm also keen to understand specifically in the mortgage origination market how we can stimulate more refinancings across the board. So um, I've been asking questions about that because one of the ways that um, the interest rate environment can transmit to households. Well, let, let me, let me, I, I invite to you to be able to yeah. look at where the impediments to refinancing. Thank are. you. Well, you, you should look at that. But I mean, the market has driven refinancings to an all time high. And uh, every month, my household, uh, a current mortgage holder got uh, from 10 or 15 different companies, bank and non-bank alike, offering refinance assistance. And I hope, uh, all, I hope almost all homeowners get that. I, I understand that it's- Yeah, I, high, I will, I'll let you do your research on that point. Uh, okay. But uh, refinancing, and I'd like you, I'll ask a submit a record question. Should Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac be disproportionately buying refinance loans or should they focus on first home mortgages? What's your view on that? What's their mission? Helping low moderate income people. Is that principally done by helping uh, that first time homeowner? Jenny May does that, but for low moderate income people, is that, should that be an emphasis of Freddie and Fannie or should they refinance uh, Jeff Bezos' second home? So, as you know, three seconds. The, the Federal Housing Finance Agency is not the agency I lead. I am not the conservator of Fannie okay. and Freddie, but right. and I'm happy to take questions for the record on we, that. We will do that. I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you, Chairwoman Waters, for this hearing. And uh, Mr. Director, thank you for being here so early uh, in your uh, term or in your tenure. Uh, I want to thank you for all your work and especially for your investment in small businesses, as I, too, am a former small business as I also support our service members and our veterans. And I wanna thank you and the previous acting director for your work, because many of us will remember under the last administration uh, that veterans and service members were not protected as they should have been with the CFPB. Uh, I don't know if you or everybody has heard of or remember the Mulvaney discount. Well, for you or those who have not heard of this term, the Mulvaney discount was a term that was used under the Trump's administration's leadership of the CFPB, where CFPB would bring an enforcement action against someone who had broke our consumer protection laws, and, but they would drop their fine to a mere $1 because the defendant simply said, well, I can't pay the bill or I can't pay the fine. Uh, for example, under the CFPB, under Trump's administration, they would actually, if they were, and we know how our veterans and service members have been out on the front line and all of the things that affected them. So it's very important to me and should be to all of our members that we don't go back to that previous administration and what the Trump administration, what Mulvaney did. So is this a practice that you're aware of or you plan to... Uh, change or continue uh, during your administration? So, Congresswoman, we will apply the civil penalty factors as Congress um, and the courts have directed us and have interpreted. 
Um, of course, with respect to service members and veterans, I've already had a chance to speak with some other agencies about how to revitalize some of the work that we'll do there. We need to make sure the Military Lending Act and other key protections are enforced. I will share with you that there may in fact be some instances where the civil penalty um, is a dollar. I don't know the individual circumstances, but assessing a civil penalty for against a judgment-proof defendant, if they are truly judgment-proof, can open up redress under the civil penalty fund, but under no circumstances will we not we deviate from the, the legislative and court-administered factors to, to do that. Let me go to another uh, question. Uh, under the previous administration, I confronted the CFPB for refusing to bring enforcement actions a violation of fair lending laws. They only brought us three cases under the leadership of not only Bill Bainey, but often also under Craninger. So I guess my question is, you've already brought in, in the 10 months that you've been in there, more than what they did throughout their entire administration. Now, give me your opinion. Do you think it is that all of a sudden people started having these fair lending violations or they turned a blind eye to it? Because I had a hard time believing, and after talking to some of the long-term staff over there that, and not being getting an answer to that, uh, I believe that there were some fair lending uh, issues going on. So can you address that? Well, all I can do is speak for myself. Um, I am very determined to make sure that we are administering the laws that forbid illegal discrimination on Friday. Um, I joined the Attorney General in a law enforcement action against Trustmark Bank for some pretty egregious uh, discriminatory behavior. Um, again, I, we wanna make sure that we are not disadvantaging those financial institutions who follow the law, play by the rules, and treat people equally. Uh, it's not fair to them, and we need a market that is free of discrimination. Well, well thank you so much, and we'll continue to have a dialogue uh, as we talk about fair lending. Certainly, we're having a lot of movement, uh, thanks to our chair in the housing area, and we'll come back and also talk about diversity and how you're moving forward with that. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The committee will break for a short five minute recess.
With gentleman from I couldn't hear that, Madam Chair. You're being recognized, Mr. Ember, for your five Thank minutes. you, Madam Chair. I, I have a lot to get uh, on, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, Director Chopra, uh, Ranking Member McHenry referred to reports that former Acting Director Wigio unlawfully removed career CFPB, CFPB staff mm. to make room for your hand-picked replacements. Here's the specific allegation in case uh, anyone missed it. This is from a story that appeared in GovExec on June 14th, 2021. It states, quote, the Biden administration is taking unusual steps to ensure it can install its own hires into top career positions at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and push out officials who served under President Trump, according to several current and former employees. CFPB in recent months has offered separation incentives including early retirement and launched investigations into career senior executives to sideline them, targeting about a half dozen of the highest ranked non-political staffers at the Bureau, close quote. These are serious allegations. <coughs> if the Inspector General finds these allegations to be true, it is clear that President Biden's political team violated a law stating that discrimination based on political affiliation is prohibited. The Supreme Court held that the president can remove the director of the CFPB for any reason or for no reason at all. But let me be clear, the Supreme Court did not exempt the CFPB from laws that prohibit removing career civil servants based on their political affiliation. Mr. Chopra, were you aware of the Biden administration's plan to push out career officials who were hired during the Trump administration? I don't believe there was a plan to do that, but I with just, respect I just asked to the allegations, well, were I you aware? I yes or no? I couldn't be aware if there wasn't a plan. So it's no. Did anyone at the White House ever discuss CFPB personnel with you, sir? I was a nominee, so I was nominated, and that was through presidential. Personnel. Again, I, I'm going to. I'm trying to be very clear, and I, I have a limited amount of time. Did anyone at the White House, who I'm assuming you've had communications with? before you were nominated, once you were nominated, and since you've been confirmed, have, before you were actually confirmed, did you have any, uh, anyone at the White House ever discuss CFPB personnel with you? There has been never been any discussions with the White House about career civil servants or any indications of that matter. Since I took office, Thank I have begun to Thank you very much. If I could move on to my next about, question. Sir, I'll reclaim my time. Did you discuss the CFPB workforce with Leandra, Eng Leandra English at any time since the election last November? No. The workforce? Director, I, no, I'll say it again. Did you discuss, uh, uh, people that work at the CFPB, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Did you ever discuss people who work at the CFPB with Leandra English at any time since the election last November? I don't recall ever speaking to her about personnel issues. Thank you. Director Chopra, if there are people on your senior political team who hired or fired career staff because of their political affiliation, I expect you'll take some sort of corrective action. And my question to you, sir, will you rehire the people who were wrongfully terminated? If there are findings of any prohibited personnel practice, we will take appropriate disciplinary action. So, so and would you rehire anyone who was wrongfully terminated because of their political affiliation? Well, it, if there is a finding of that, which I have no indication to suggest yes there will no, be, sir. I will take all the steps that I am required to under the law, including if required rehiring. I hope that, yes, thank you. I also think it will be important to know whether any of the actions and questions occurred with your knowledge or at your direction. If so, I think you may need to consider whether to recuse yourself from any decisions related to this matter. If it turns out, sir, that you are implicated in the scheme to remove career staff based on their perceived political affiliations, can I have your commitment that you will recuse yourself from any decision uh, any decision making related to corrective action? I will not be implicated in it because I did not engage in that behavior. But if you were, you would recuse yourself, correct? Uh, if, if uh, on any directive about law findings, of course I will adhere to that, but you can Thank trust you. me, I did not engage in the allegations you are suggesting. Thank you. Will you fully cooperate with the IG's investigation in this matter? 
I will always cooperate with the Inspector General of the Federal Thank Reserve you. System. And will you instruct the agency's political staff to co cooperate with the investigation? Everyone must cooperate with the IG. And you'll tell them that they must, right? Yes, and I, I've also told them that they must adhere to all ethics rules as well. Thank we you. need to make sure that all of those are being followed and that there are not preferences. I see my time has expired. We'll wait and see what the IG finds in this case. I yield back. Thank you. Once time has expired, uh, we will now hear from the gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on housing, community development, and insurance. She's now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and congratulations, uh, Director Chopra, on your new position, and thank you so much for being here. And I also want to thank the CFPB for listening to me and others on this committee and finally resuming the Military Lending Act examinations that you're supposed to have been doing for a long time to protect our service members. So thank you so much for stepping up for our service members in the way that we should. And I hope that will continue. Uh, and I really hope to hear about any other issues that you find that we can be helping you with here in Congress. Now, I do intend to ask you questions about the work that you're doing, because I think that's important for these hearings. So let me get right to it. I know you've only been there for a couple of weeks now, um, but I want to check on the status and planning of a couple of other areas that I've been asking the CFPB about. First, I asked your predecessor about the student loan servicers and whether the CFPB was actually, uh, you know, doing the exams to protect the 40 million Americans who have these student loans. Um, I've asked her that a couple times, never got a straight answer. Uh, I know this used to be your department. So can you give me an update on where those things are right now with the CFPB's oversight of student loan servicers? So I, I want to be mindful of the protections in the law about confidential supervisory information, but I will share that um, student loan servicers, the large ones, are subject to the uh, supervisory authority of the CFPB, and I intend to make sure we are supervising them appropriately. We will, of course, work with other regulators, including the Department of Education, to do so. But unless the law is being followed, we cannot be certain that um, our borrowers are going to be able to be on the road to repayment or be protected from, from uh, unlawful practices. OK, thank you for that. And what are the actual benefits, I'm, I'm hoping that you can tell us, for those borrowers, having the agency looking out for them and actually having this oversight happen for the first time in years? Well, I think it's important to make sure that we're protecting both the borrowers and the honest companies who are engaged in these businesses. It's not fair to the law-abiding businesses when some get a free pass. So when it comes to student loans, for example, good servicing um, on student loans, mortgages, helps avoid defaults, helps avoid foreclosures, and ultimately adheres to the congressional directives to the CFPB. Perfect. Well, that will certainly help folks out. Thank you so much for that. Um, I also know that over the last couple of months, homeowners have had some new protections from foreclosures, including now they have the right to a new streamlined loan modification options because of COVID hardships. Can you walk us through uh, what those protections are and a little bit of how you see those working so far? Yes. Yeah, so as I understand the amended rule, it provides a uh, way for servicers to help transition borrowers from the forbearance programs back into repayment. This is obviously can be very challenging, you know, especially for borrowers who have been dealing, who have been struggling during the pandemic. So I think the win-win here is for servicers to be able to evaluate borrowers for these alternatives to foreclosure, that's good for the investors, that's good for the borrower, um, and it's really good for the economy. So of course it's a temporary um, rule to assist with the orderly transition, but we wanna make sure we do not repeat what happened last time, which was unnecessary, avoidable, and illegal foreclosures. Um, and there were too many of them, and the effects were devastating. I, I would say, Congresswoman, um, I'm also particularly interested in farm bankruptcies, um, foreclosures in rural areas. I know that's of interest to you. And I think we need to understand um, all of the issues facing family farms. It's an area I've worked on for many years. We cannot have a resilient and strong country without a base of thriving family farms who can afford their obligations. 
I'll tell you what, uh, Director, you're talking my language there. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And as I'm, I'm currently working uh, to get affordable housing extensions, you know, more funding through the USDA, but we need a lot of help in our rural areas. And I'm so glad to, to hear you say that. And of course, we want to make sure that we prevent foreclosures as much as possible. So these loan modifications are a great way to do this. I just want to let you know this is one of my top priorities to, um, to make sure that people can actually benefit from these programs. So I made sure we got $100 million to support housing counselors to help people walk through this process. And I'm wondering, last question, are you working with these housing counselors on those modifications to make sure that they're doing the best they can to serve Americans? Yeah, housing counselors are often on the front lines of helping borrowers not only get a home, but to keep their home. So I, I don't have the details handy uh, this early, but you, you have my commitment that we will not be forgetting about the housing counselors. And I know firsthand how much a vehicle they are to really helping people when it comes to the dream of home ownership. General Women's Time. Thank you. I'm time. Appreciate it. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lytle Milk, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Director Chopper. Thank you for being here. Several topics I would like to discuss. The first being uh, the rulemaking to implement Dodd-Frank Section 1033. As part of that, I hope the CFPB will take into account the significant progress the private sector is making on consumer data issues, specifically <coughs> moving away from screen scraping of login credentials and transitioning to APIs. I think it would be counterproductive to impede or duplicate the work that the private sector is doing. So the question is, do you intend to build on the work that's being done in the private sector as part of Section 1033 rulemaking, and will you make sure to not interfere with that work? I think that makes sense. I think um, the way we can realize a lot of the benefits of any Section 1033 rulemaking, and I, I, it's too early to say what the timeline would be on that, We've got to look at actually what are the systems and protocols and technologies that are already being in use and how they're working or not working. I think I am, to be transparent with you, going to look at it with the eye, of course, of competition, security, privacy. In many cases, open APIs or APIs will, will be a huge vehicle to do so. Um, but I take what you're saying seriously. If there's already um, a movement or there's developments that we can learn from to help expand, I'm totally on board with that and um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Well, I appreciate that because uh, quite frankly, it's the private sector that are innovators, not the federal government. Uh, more than often, the federal government tends to be suppressors of innovation. So anything that we can do to uh, encourage innovation and keep things going in the right direction, I applaud. Can I add one point? It's just that sure. I want to make sure, though, that I look at private sector initiatives to make sure that um, there can't be kind of one dominant controller of it. You know, the more that we have an open system right. that people can enter, they don't need a lot of permission slips and, you know, red tape, corporate red tape to cut through, I'm going to be looking at that. All right. The CFPB has also proposed a rule to implement Dodd-Frank Section 1071, which will require lenders to collect and report data on the demographics of small business borrowers. I hope you'll minimize the burden of these requirements. The 1071 rule making, the 1071 rule proposes making the data available to the public annually. To determine what data is released, the rule proposes a balancing test to measure the risk and benefits of publicly, publicly disclosing the data. What risk do you believe should be considered in this test? So, uh, you know, again, I, I'm just on the job, but I'll just share my personal views on this, is that we need to be thinking very hard always about re-identification risk. So um, in many cases, technologies have advanced that there are more data points that can be put together to re-identify. And so what I'm gonna be looking for is making sure we're implementing the objectives to make sure we're collecting this data, that it's being able to be used to guard against discrimination and other violations, but also that any data sets we make available you know, are still consistent with the objectives of, of safeguarding privacy as well. So far, CFPB hasn't accepted public comment on this issue. Will you be open to uh, accepting public input on the balance test before it goes into effect? Um, 
I need to check on this. I thought that in the proposed rule, um, it did discuss um, implementing a balancing test, and I think we are collecting comment on all aspects of the rule. If I'm mistaken, um, we're happy to follow up with you, but of course, um, all agencies need guidance when it comes right. to protecting data. So our understanding is it hasn't been done. Okay. If it isn't, will you? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely eager to hear views on how to make sure we are, we're balancing that right. Okay, so you will ask for public input if it hasn't been done before it's If it implemented. hasn't been, for sure. I would want to make sure we ask for input, particularly okay. from technology and data experts and others. Okay. Um, last question, if I have time. In April, the CFPB issued an interim final rule regarding debt collection practices during COVID-19. The rule classified landlords as debt collectors and accused landlords of refusing to accept tenants' self-attestation of hardship based on unverified anecdotal evidence from activist groups. Fortunately, that rule no longer applies because the Supreme Court struck down CDC's illegal eviction moratorium, but is still troubling. Understand you weren't in this position during that time period, but in any issue going forward, could we get your commitment that your uh, policies will be based on concrete facts and data, not unverified antidotes, especially from activist organizations? So just to be clear, you're saying that that rule covered landlords? The, yes, the, the, okay. the rule I, classified landlords as debt collectors. Okay, Th that wasn't my understanding. I'm happy to look into that. I understood that, um, you know, pursuant to the FDCPA, that it was third parties collecting on behalf of landlords who are covered. Um, but I, I, to your question, I, of course, want to make sure we are being analytically robust whenever we can. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on investor protection, entrepreneurship, and capital markets, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much to Director Chopra for your time and your patience with all of us today. Um, I, I got some questions about um, discriminatory lending, and I, I want to go through just ridiculous hypotheticals to start, but um, so bear with me, but, but I want to leave enough time for the substance on the back end. Is, as you know, the Equal um, Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 prohibits lending institutions from discriminating on the basis of all the usual protected classes, race, religion, national origin, what have you. Um, so I want to just start with a, just a completely softball hypothetical. If a lending institution was to intentionally or unintentionally but effectively market their products to groups of people that had the practical effect of reducing minorities, certain religious groups, access to to loans, would that constitute a violation of the ECOA? Uh, as I'm sure you know, um, all of us in the banking regulatory area like to avoid these type of hypotheticals, but I'll, I'll speak to, I'll try my best to answer. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act um, implicates not just underwriting decisions, but in, in across the entire credit transaction. So it can affect collections, it can affect marketing and advertising. Uh, you may be aware, Secretary Carson issued a complaint against Facebook for violations of the Fair Housing Act that related to some of these issues uh, about advertising. There is some corollary uh, between the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and we're happy well, to follow up with some of the specific regulations. Um, well, that have been I, appreciate, I appreciate the nuance. I appreciate the nuance, and and uh, that's the challenge of these five minute hearings. Is sometimes there's not enough time for nuance. But the, the, the stipulate that that there are some things that within that nuance are indeed problematic. It, it is does the CFPB under your leadership have the authority? and or the obligation to investigate and prosecute crimes under the ECOA of the type we just talked about? Yes. Okay. Um, and if a company was violating those, is knowledge that their, that their marketing techniques were discriminatory um, a prerequisite for, for prosecution? Or if, they are, if, 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 they're loaning, if their lending practices are discriminatory but were not intentional, does that absolve them of liability? Yeah, so the Supreme Court, um, there's jurisprudence on this. It's also in the regulation. Um, th there's, there's disparate treatment um, and disparate impact. And so in the disparate impact context, um, you, you need not necessarily uh, prove intentionality um, to uh, get to okay. liability. Okay, well, that's consistent with my understanding. So here's now the substantive reason for the question. Um, 
it has been brought to my attention that a number of folks in the in the lending industry, when they make a decision whether or not to advertise on Facebook, Facebook cannot share and has refused to share any information about whether the algorithms they use to boost their ad tracking are in fact intentionally targeting certain racial groups, certain you know, classes of people. And um, could have the practical effect, especially in light of all this news over the last you know weeks that Facebook's algorithms have a habit of you know, targeting and amplifying and boosting signals from white supremacist groups like the Proud Boys. Um, given your prior answers, is a lender that is advertising on a platform that uses algorithms that may prove to be discriminatory or maybe have already been proven to be discriminatory, is that lender potentially guilty of an ECOA violation? Uh, it really depends on the facts and circumstances, but in fact, Facebook in your circums in your hypothetical may be liable for that. Um, and would you have liability or the jurisdiction to pursue a claim against the platform as opposed to the lender or, or both? You know, I, it, it depends on the exact activities, but just in uh, like Secretary Carson's complaint where um, Facebook was making those decisions um, in your hypothetical, um, when a tech company like that or in, is making the decision, uh, they may in fact be liable. Okay, so um, last just question for as we sit here. If the platform cannot guarantee that their marketing channels are not in some fashion discriminatory in a way that would violate the ECOA, would you advise a lender to continue advertising on that platform? Well, I, I'm happy to take, you know, I, I'd rather take this question for the record because it's a complex one to answer in nine seconds. But I am very worried about black box algorithms that we have no accountability as to how decisions are made. This is the opposite of relationship banking. And we need to make sure that, they, that firms cannot dodge fair lending laws and anti-discrimination laws under the guise of their secret algorithm. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Look forward to following up with your staff afterwards. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kossoff, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Director, congratulations on your confirmation. Thank you for being here today. Um, we've heard a lot, obviously, in the past several months about cryptocurrencies and digital assets. They've gotten a lot of attention. What do you see as the CFPB's role with respect to cryptocurrencies and digital assets? So depending on the laws that uh, are implicated, Obviously, there is a fact-based determination as to any sort of law that cryptocurrencies or digital currencies have to comply with. Um, this is obviously something that the CFPB is working with the other regulators on, but I will tell you where digital payments is involved. The Electronic Fund Transfer Act is a key law with key consumer protections. Obviously, the Graham Leach Bliley Act the privacy provisions of that are a key law that we enforce. This is part of the reason the Bureau issued orders to the tech companies about how they are trafficking payments, what data they are collecting, how they are using it, how they are engaged in you know, surveillance or de denial of service, um, all of those matter. And I think there's some intersections there with digital currencies as well. I, I, I don't like using absolute terms, but do, uh, to Paraphrase what you just said. Do you see your, the CFPB's only lane as being in terms of the, in terms of the payments? Um, I would need to review all of our laws. There, there may be certain circumstances um, where there may be lending going involved. I need to really think through that and get back to you on it. Um, I do want to make sure that we are guarding our payment system and, and taking care of the consumer protections um, that you all have passed. Fair enough. In your prior role at the FTC, uh, almost two years ago in November of 2019, you commented on the FedNow service. You may remember. I'm, I'm quoting from uh, the opening paragraph of your comment. Uh, you said you want to, you write to outline support for the Federal Reserve's proposal to develop the FedNow service, a new round-the-clock real-time payment system. The proposal is a natural extension 
of the Federal Reserve's existing role in check clearing wire transfers in the automated clearinghouse system. A private mega bank monopoly over our faster payment system would suppress innovation and distort incentives in our markets. The Federal Reserve should not cede control of the plumbing of our future payment systems to Wall Street. Now that was that was in your in your prior role. In your current role, what what do you see as the CFPB's role as it relates to the FedNow service, if any? That's a good question. I think the extent to which they're creating the FedNow service, I think we can serve as appropriate as experts on consumer protection within the Federal Reserve System. Um, I know this is an area of great importance to our local financial institutions and community banks. Um, the CFPB has a community bank advisory committee that you know I want to engage on payments issues, but um, obviously our core is the consumer protection laws, and there are certain places perhaps related to fraud or error resolution where we may have relative expertise. Is there potential for the Fed now service to, if you will, crowd out the private, sec private sector? I would have a tough time seeing that. I think our payments ecosystem is always going to be diverse. There's going to be many different ways in which money is transferred. I do think from a national security perspective and global competitiveness, we need to have faster payments in our country. I think the fact that we're being beaten out when it comes to speedy payments by China and others is a concern for me. So I think it's really the public sector and the private sector all have to really work to make sure that we can compete in that way. Thank you, Director. In your prior life, maybe in your current life also, you were a prolific tweeter, almost like a member of Congress. Uh, March of last year, March 6th, your tweet, it's time to end the era of law-breaking megabanks. Their empire building brought our economy to the brink. Their scale made them too big to fail, and their executives have turned boring banking into a risky business model built to break the law. Two questions, who are you talking about? And secondly, is it within your purview to, quote, end the law-breaking megabanks? Well, I have to tell you, one of the things that bothers me so much is when small players break the law, they get shut down. And when the large players repeatedly break the law, it feels like nothing happens. In my testimony, I submitted one of the areas that is going to be a focus for me is the issue of repeat offenders. We cannot have a system where a small financial player you know, get, is caught and then totally gets wiped out while a big one gets to just pay fines over and over and over again and the law breaking continues. If we find the regulators, not just the CFPB, but the OCC, the Federal Reserve and others, that they do not have the managerial acumen and operational plans to follow agency and, and federal court orders, we have a serious problem there. This was my experience in, at the FTC where some of the largest players repeatedly violated the law and nothing happened. Who were the law-breaking The megabanks? gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, who is also vice chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection in Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. And um, I want to express my gratitude to our chair for our continued commitment uh, to this issue. And congratulations to, to you, Director Chopra. It's good to see you. I'm excited and grateful that you'll be a partner at the helm of the CFPB. I wanted to speak to you about an issue um, that I've been sounding the alarm on uh, for over a year now, uh, what I know you're very familiar with, an issue of um, educational redlining. Uh, borrowers who attended an HBCU or other minority serving institutions have faced thousands of dollars in additional charges because of these discriminatory algorithms. And we have companies like Upstart and Stride Funding who are practicing educational redlining, uh, continue to be engaged in this practice uh, in the student loan market. And these companies are using information about where borrowers went to school, their major, or their parents' educational attainment to price loans or make credit decisions. Uh, so, Director Chopra, um, what is the Bureau doing to address the risk that black and brown borrowers 
that arise from the use of algorithmic decision-making in lending and the reliance on so-called alternative underwriting criteria, such as borrower's educational background. So Congresswoman, there has been a myth that algorithms can be completely neutral. In reality, many of those algorithms reinforce the biases that already exist. I joined the Attorney General on Friday to talk about how we need to make sure that there's some a level of accountability on algorithmic decision making, that we can make determinations about whether the law is being followed. And you know, a traditional financial institution that uses more traditional methods, they shouldn't be held to a standard while others get to hide behind their algorithm. So that is something that we will need to look carefully at, not just the CFPB, but others. And I would hate to see that we are reinforcing biases based on the enrollment of a particular school, um, particularly as you mentioned, if they went to a historically black college or university. Thank you, Director. Now, during the Trump administration, the Bureau renewed a no action letter, which allowed Upstart to act with impunity under the guise of spurring, quote, financial innovation, unquote. With respect to educational redlining and algorithm bias, do you agree, um, just one more time for the record, that discrimination is wrong and that no regulator should make carve outs that allow people to discriminate? I under no circumstances believe any regulator should give a permission slip to engage in illegal discrimination. Okay, wonderful, good to hear. Um, uh, transitioning uh, to a topic um, that you're very familiar with, uh, I wanted to talk with you about student debt cancellation. Again, to be clear, the most efficient way for President Biden to provide relief for <coughs> millions of borrowing families is to provide across the board student debt cancellation. Um, we are approaching the mark where those uh, payments could uh, restart. And the fact that we would uh, consider doing such a thing during an ongoing pandemic-induced recession is really unconscionable. Um, as you well know, there are more than four in 10 federal direct loan borrowers uh, would have to be transferred to a new student loan service if these payments resumed. Director Chopra, given these simultaneous risks, what is the CFPB doing within its oversight authority to ensure that borrowers are not harmed should these payments resume? It is very important that just like the chairwoman talked about with mortgage servicing, the resumption to repayment um, could be really messy and we need to do everything we can to make sure it's not. And the same goes for student loans. If 40 million people all need to resume payments, we will need to make sure that servicers and others are doing so in an orderly and lawful way and I intend to use our tools to contribute to efforts to make sure that it, they are doing so. Well, thank you for uh, that commitment to uh, use your oversight authority to ensure that borrowers are not harmed uh, should these payments resume. I know unlike President Biden, you do not personally have the authority to cancel student debt, but I do think the CFPB's job would be much easier if the president honored his promise and finally canceled student debt. Uh, we were speaking about HBCUs a moment ago, and they, those presidents are using their ARPA funds uh, to cancel student debt because this is a, a racial justice issue and an economic justice issue, uh, and one, I think, uh, critical to a, a just uh, recovery as well. But in closing, I, I look forward to working together to address the unprecedented uh, student loan debt crisis and other issues that my constituents care about, like ending discriminatory lending in the housing market, debt collection harassment, and harmful credit reporting practices. Uh, congratulations once again, and thank you. Thank you, ma'am. General's woman, time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for holding this hearing, and Director Chopra, thank you for appearing before us, and it's good to meet you face-to-face uh, -face for this. Uh, we appreciate you being here for this <coughs> annual review of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm gonna dive right in. Director Chopra, the Bureau has previously acknowledged the key role that small dollar loans can play in helping consumers meet credit needs, usually resulting from unexpected expenses that Americans uh, often incur. According to the spring 2021 semi-annual report of the Bureau, uh, what percent of consumer complaints received by the Bureau were related to short-term small dollar loans? Do you know off the top of your head? 
I don't. I think the vast bulk of complaints, um, I think maybe even 40 to 50 percent relate to credit reporting and debt collection issues. That's sure. by far the largest component. Well, it might not surprise you then to learn that the number that the report shows that it was 0.2 percent or two in every 1,000 complaints. So given the amount of resources that the CFPB has focused on small dollar lenders, I was surprised to learn from the Bureau's own data that only 0.2 percent of complaints received by the Bureau were attributed to short term or small dollar lenders. Um, Director Chopra, yes or no, do you believe that small dollar lending can play a positive role in helping consumer meet, uh, consumers meet their credit needs? Yes, there are many short-term liquidity products, whether it's a credit card, whether it's any sort of small dollar loan. Um, of course, that plays an important role and it would be good to see um, many more financial institutions offering that. Thank you, I agree very, very much about that. Switching topics, I wanted to discuss the Bureau's recently proposed rule and request for public comment for small business lending data collection under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. This proposed rule seeks to require covered financial institutions to collect and report to the Bureau data on applications for credit for small business. As several of my colleagues have noted, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty regarding this rulemaking. According to the proposed rule, the Bureau is aiming to create the first comprehensive database of small business credit applications in the United States. If this rule is finalized, how will the Bureau protect and safeguard the information collected and stored in this government-run database? It's a great question. So um, I, I believe in the notice of proposed rulemaking, um, there is a section on how there will be balancing to protect privacy, to protect re-identification risk. Ultimately, the Bureau is seeking to implement the statutory directive and there is a court order to do so in a timely fashion. Um, I'm going as I mentioned to one of your colleagues, I think there's many ways we can look at uh, how we can make sure we're implementing those objectives while also um, protecting some of the issues you've raised. In many ways, it's a similar exercise to the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act database that currently exists and collects uh, information on mortgage origination, but obviously there's some very important differences. Sure. To follow up there on the topic of information security, earlier this year, the Office of Inspector General for the CFPB issued a memorandum entitled 2021 Major Management Challenges for the Bureau. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, memorandum. The memo listed the management challenges in order of significance and the number one challenge, number one challenge listed for the Bureau was ensuring that an effective information security program is in place. The memo noted that although the Bureau is working toward implementing effective identity and access management controls, challenges to effectively safeguarding sensitive agency data remain. The IRS is currently trying to get their hands uh, on the account data of millions of Americans, and the CFPB also wants to collect massive amounts of data. It seems like the Biden administration is attempting a major uh, grab of information. Why should we trust the government to successfully protect all of this information, and can I get a commitment from you that this government-run database will not be live until there is absolute confidence in the security of the system? Yeah, so uh, almost every federal agency right now, because of uh, many of the cyber attacks from state and non-state actors, we all know uh, the United States is a big target. And every agency needs to be at the top of its game when it comes to protecting our cybersecurity. There are many, many ways in which every agency needs to push forward. I, I was very closely involved in a lot of the data security issues in my last job at the FTC. And I intend to make sure that we not only follow that directive, um, but we're constantly looking for ways to improve. The gentleman's Thank time has expired. Thank you, Director Chopra, and I yield back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is now recognized for five minutes. How are you, Director? Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you so much, sir. Um, in his executive order advocating for antitrust reforms, President Biden called upon the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to complete rulemaking on Section 1033 of Dodd-Frank which as you know establishes the right of consumers to access and transfer their own financial information. Uh, what, what is your timetable for finalizing Section 1033 rulemaking in accordance with the President's executive order? So uh, 
I am very, very interested in making sure that consumers are not trapped or stuck in a product they don't want, that they can switch, that they have more opportunities. I think competition is something every agency, including the CFPB, should promote. I want to be able to give you a firm timeline. Two weeks in, I can't do that. But there is a process underway. There has been an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. We're assessing more. We're consulting experts. I've been personally trying to learn about the UK's open banking system. Um, but I really see this as a great opportunity for all of us. But I'm, I'm pleased to see that you believe, as, as I do, that consumer control of data is critical to competition and consumer choice, uh, ensuring open markets. Um, if, if I, as a consumer, ask a bank to share my financial information with a competing financial inf institution, should the bank be required to comply with that request? Well, I, as a general matter, I think people need to control their personal data. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with the surveillance style system that I think we are seeing, not just in China, but also here where companies are collecting all sorts of highly detailed information on us, sometimes without our consent, sometimes without our knowledge. Can I actually ask about that? Um, Please. Because it brings to mind data aggregators. Is your agency going to play a greater role in supervising and regulating data aggregators? What are your thoughts on that? So in some circumstances, depending on the activities of them, um, there are many laws that they have to follow. Um, there may be privacy rules. There but, may but general be supervision and regulation. Yeah, no, d aggregators are a key part of something we have to look at, including to understand the Section 1033 rulemaking. I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked the SEC commissioner uh, about neither admit nor deny settlements. And I'll offer a, a perspective that I've heard from constituents. You know, if you're a poor kid from the Bronx who commits a minor crime and then enters into a plea bargain, as part of the process of entering into a plea bargain, that young kid would be expected to admit wrongdoing, to plead guilty. That young kid would likely have a criminal record that would haunt him for much of his life. But if a rich corporation defrauds millions of people out of millions of dollars and then enters into a settlement with CFPB, that corporation will likely enter into a settlement without ever admitting wrongdoing. That corporation can move on as if it had done nothing wrong. You know, financial regulators like SEC and CFPB essentially protect corporate bad actors <clears throat> from the consequences of their bad behavior, the reputational consequences of their bad behavior. Does that seem fair to you? Because it seems unfair to me, and it's certainly unfair to the people I represent. No, and in fact, in criminal law, it's almost unheard of to be able to allow this kind of den outright denial. One of the things that um, I have written about in the past and intend to explore is what is the role of findings and admissions to promote compliance, promote fairness in our markets. And I, I, I agree with you. I'm uncomfortable with this sort of blanket approach of constant denials of liability. So are you committed to either banning the practice or radically reducing the practice? Well, I want to I want to talk about it with you further. There are some trade-offs. Um, but I do think we need a policy that actually makes it um, figure out when we will actually do it, because right now I think it is overused. And I think you, you, you referenced that you were studying examples of open finance elsewhere in the world. Is, 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 is there a country that you look to as a model? No. For the United I, States? Or? I, I have to tell you, I, I want to learn from all of those countries, but we have to do something that works for our people. We have a much more diverse country. We have a large country. Um, I'm not wanting to replicate what the Chinese or the British are doing. Um, we need to do something that is uniquely ours and that suits our people and our financial system. Great. My time's about to expire. So again, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you, sir. The gentleman yells back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair and director. Thanks for being here in person today, and congrats on your new role. Um, director Chopra, um, under former director Cordray, the Bureau was notorious for carrying out well, regulation by enforcement. Essentially, the Bureau expected financial services providers to figure out the rules based on press releases and announcing enforcement actions, instead of providing ahead of time clear guidance or actual rulemakings on the front end. So in your confirmation hearing, uh, 
I think it's relevant, uh, and this is your quote. I also will commit that the CFPB and every federal agency should be focused on fixing harms, making it clear to market participants what's expected of them, end quote. So will you commit to avoiding the practice of regulation by enforcement? So I always want to make sure, and I've shared with some of your colleagues, the best situation is when the law is clear, it's easy to administer, easy to follow, easy to enforce. So I do aspire with respect to our laws to be able to make sure it's durable, understandable, but we will also need to enforce the law as written and how the Congress has written that statute. It's not, we don't have the ability to veto laws we do have to administer the laws you pass, and I want to make sure that it is uh, understandable um, and that we can figure out ways to do that. Sure, but the, the kind of the question is regulation by enforcement. When, when there's an unknown out there, where there's lack of clarity, where the standard that you just mentioned isn't there, and then all of a sudden there's, there's regulation through the mechanism of enforcement. And uh, do you see any problems with that approach? Well, regulation by enforcement? I, th I think what I shared with one of your colleagues is I think we need to go up and focus our resources against large players engaged in wide scale harms. I don't believe in strong arming small businesses into settlements to create some sort of law. I think we need to litigate more and we need to make sure that the courts are developing the law with us so that that creates more understanding and greater jurisprudence. But do you, agree, do you agree system. that there should be clarity ahead of time before they're, um, before they're attacked by regulation by enforcement? Do you think they should have had a standard ahead of time rather than some enforcement mechanism, uh, just regulation through enforcement? All of a sudden there's an enforcement without having a clarity ahead of time. Well, in, in the context of a litigation, a court would not say that a firm is liable if it did not believe if it was violating the law. So we also have to enforce the laws you have written. And in many cases, we can develop it further, but we can't just stop enforcing a law that you all have told us to enforce. Thank you. I want to shift gears. I know a lot of my colleagues have asked about this today, and it's become quite popular. But you mentioned earlier today that there are interagency discussions between Fed Chairman Powell and, Tre and Treasury Secretary Yellen on the regulation of cryptocurrency and stable coins. But Chairman Powell told me, sitting at that very desk um, earlier this month, that he had no intention to ban or overregulate cryptocurrency. So, Director, do you have a different view than Chairman Powell on the regulation of cryptocurrency? S sorry if I misspoke. I thought what I said to your colleague was that the issue of virtual currencies, stable coins, cryptocurrency, it is a subject of discussion um, across the administration. There is a working group, um, the president's working group, that is covering some of these issues. So um, I apologize if I misspoke earlier. I, I just want to clarify. Thank you for that, uh, Director. As a matter of policy, is it your intention to use your regulatory authority to ban or limit the use of cryptocurrency or blockchain technology? No. No. Is, is uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that we're, that we're clear. See if it's your intention to regulate um, or ban the use of cryptocurrency or just, blockchain technology. Just, to, just so we're using the same, uh, that doesn't mean that the CFPB should not be um, looking at payments. So payments, is, and this is part of why I issued the orders last week to collect information from the big tech companies. Some of those laws that we administer may implicate um, virtual currencies, but as you've asked, no, I don't have the intention, but I do want to make sure we're administering the laws that protect our payment system. That's fine, but you do not have an intention to ban or limit the use of, crypt of cryptocurrency or blockchain technology as a whole? No. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, who is also the chair of the Task Force on Financial Technology, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, uh, Director. Good to see you, and uh, congratulations on your appointment. Uh, I know that some of my colleagues have raised this issue uh, previously, but I, I did want to talk about uh, something I uniquely uh, believe that uh, both my, my friends on the other side of the aisle as well as my 
fellow Democrats uh, believe is important, um, and that is uh, that consumers own their own data and they should have control over their, their data. Um, and I know that you're, you're engaged in a rulemaking on, on uh, Dodd-Frank 1033. Um, do you have a time frame in terms of? Uh, you know, being two weeks in, I don't. Um, but I will share with you, as I shared with others, that I think this is a real um, opportunity to create more competition, to create more opportunities. And um, I I'm going to be reviewing the work to date um, to see what we can accomplish. But I apologize that I don't have a timeline at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you did, you did in Section 3.5 of your, your annual report, you did have a vague reference to the ongoing uh, uh, comment period. But uh, as you know, uh, this industry is moving at light speed, and we are standing still. So uh, I would just implore you to move quickly. Uh, yeah, please. please. I, I, I hear that. I'm hearing that from everybody. Um, we want to go through and understand how to do it right. I really encourage you and others, um, you know, to have discussions with us on the objectives you see. I really see comp promoting competition, promoting choice, um, allowing new entrants to be able to challenge dominant players, to be able to give people more options um, as, as yeah. critical to this. I, I am uh, keenly interested in, in consumer protection like, like you. Uh, and and I, I'm wondering, as, as we look at 1033 and, and the rulemaking, does the GDPR offer any uh, instruction uh, to how we handle consumers' uh, privacy? I mean, GDPR offers, you know, the ownership and access to information, the portability of information from one institution to another, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right <laughs> to rectification. Are those, are those elements... Uh, that you would, would embrace in terms of our own response? <clears throat> I need to give that some more thought. I think the GDPR, and frankly, uh, other state laws in the US that are about privacy and greater control of data are something that, you know, as you said, has been evolving. I think some of those principles about control and moving market power toward a family so that they have more bargaining leverage they have more ability to protect their data too. I think that's that's all right. I, look, I, I do appreciate what the states have done and, and are doing. My own state, uh, our, our uh, Secretary of State Bill Galvin has done a, a wonderful job on this uh, in, in protecting consumers. But I do think there should be a a you know a unified baseline. And if states want to do more in their particular jurisdictions, uh, they they have that right. But uh, I think it would be much better for a, a cohesive and, and uh, competitive industry if we did have a, uh, a common set of standards that uh, fintech country companies uh, could uh, could adhere to and and uh, you know I, I think it would move us all forward in a, in a very positive way um, I'm just wondering uh, as well whether GLBA uh, offers uh, enough protections from a statutory standpoint um, you know, uh, or, or whether something additional is needed? No. The GLBA privacy provisions are, are outdated. Yeah. I don't personally, of course, we will enforce that law. We will inf and, and make sure, administer it. I personally do not believe that the GLBA privacy provisions are working effectively. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, again, I, I, I welcome your, your uh, invitation to be engaged on this issue. Um, I wish you the very best. It is, uh, it, it's great to have you uh, with your background in this position. I thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Madam thank Chair, you, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. <coughs> Mooney? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Director Chopra for coming here today. Congratulations on your confirmation. In the past, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has taken a punish first and ask questions later approach. Under former Director Cordray's leadership, enforcement actions had to be reined in after the fact by the courts. This kind of approach makes it more challenging 
for businesses large and small to understand the rules they need to follow. When the rules are confusing or enforced unevenly, <coughs> businesses pour resources into compliance and attorneys. It's better for everyone, consumers included, if they can use those resources to create more jobs and expand their business. Although you're newly sworn in as director, we know that you're not new to the CFPB. You serve as assistant director under Mr. Corderay and help steer, steer the bureau during that era. My concern is that as director, you'll take the same approach to enforcement as Corderay. Uh, earlier today, you did commit to ranking member McHenry to follow the notice and comment APA rulemaking process. I was pleased to hear that and I hope you'll stick to that commitment. Uh, so, Director, in January, the CFPB finalized a joint agency rule clarifying that supervisory guidance is non-binding. Do you agree that super, supervisory guidance does not carry the force of law, and do you commit to follow your agency's January rule? Yes. Uh, just to be clear, I, as I understand, that was a interagency rulemaking clarifying that supervisory guidance is you know not enforceable in a court does not carry the force of law um, okay. frankly I think that's been agency practice forever um, but it, it is now in regulation okay good to have that clear also director Chopra in your testimony you mentioned that restoring relationship banking is a priority for you can you can you explain what you mean when you say that you want to emphasize relationship banking, and how would the CFPB play a role in that goal? So I am very concerned that there are many, many situations where consumers have no place to turn in order to get help. You know, the credit reporting industry is a great example of this, where consumers are not really the customer, they're the product. They're, it's their data that's being bought and sold. So they know, those bureaus may not necessarily have the market incentive to serve consumers well, whereas many financial institutions, especially local ones that serve their communities, they have repeat business. They uh, know their local communities. I think we are um, disadvantaged as a country the more relationship banking goes away. And I think I want to under figure out what we can do to revitalize that so that there is a greater sense about the customer having more leverage and, and, and the institutions being more responsive to them. And I think there's some places where institutions simply are not adequately responsive to customers and their needs. And I think we all can play a role in figuring out what we should do to restore that. We need that for the resilience of our country. Thank you, and you mentioned earlier choice and competition, which I also I think does benefit consumers. I agree with you on that. Uh, in your testimony, you outlined a host of priorities for the CFPB under your leadership. Notice and comment rulemaking forces regulators to take their time and listen to the public before finalizing regulations. And a comment period is important for getting these rules right. As you begin to take action on these priorities, I'd remind you that Congress makes the laws, not the agencies, and you said that earlier in your testimony that we make the laws and you're enforcing them, and therefore it's not within your power to create new policy and avoid the notice and comment rulemaking process. I would also echo some of my colleagues' comments today on the issue of regulation by enforcement. Before pursuing penalties, it's important to ask whether the rules are clear. If they're not, then enforcement action is not likely appropriate. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, for holding the meeting today, and to um, <clears throat> Director Chopra, thank you for being with us today. I know you were just sworn in a few weeks ago, so I want to echo the, the sentiments of my colleagues and say it's nice to have someone like you behind the wheel of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, uh, Director, for 40 years, I was a professor at Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, College for Women. And, and that's why it's so concerning to me that higher education has become so expensive for so many to the point of putting it out of reach for many. And I do want to just commend my colleague from Massachusetts who uh, spoke about uh, student debt and so forth earlier. 
but it's why the failures of the PSLF program are at the top of my mind. So uh, can you, um, uh, it's, uh, pl do you plan to ensure that the Bureau is committed to helping our dedicated public service workers access the student loan relief that they were promised under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program? Yes, ma'am. So a CFPB report from many years ago underscored very severe challenges that borrowers were facing in enrolling this statutorily authorized program. Um, I understand, ma'am, that there's been some changes that the Department of Education is announcing to ensure greater enrollments. But in as much that firms are lying to borrowers about that program to discourage them or dissuade them, that's ob that obviously can be in violation of the law. So you have my commitment that we will work with the Department of Education and others to make sure that that program is meeting the directives of Congress. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. It, it is an important issue, and we want to make sure that they are protected. But let me switch gears for a moment and ask about for-profit institutions of higher education. There are plenty of good actors in the for-profit for space. I want to say that, and, and I know that you're standing up, uh, or you're standing up, start standing, starting up a a new enforcement unit within SSA. So, how do you plan to collaborate uh, with the education department to hold predatory for-profit schools accountable? for student outcomes? It's a great question. So to be clear, the CFPB's jurisdiction um, is not necessarily related to schools, it's related to the offering of financial services. So in the past, the CFPB has done enforcement work in this area, particularly where those schools are offering lending products. Um, recently, the Federal Trade Commission also announced some work to be able to trigger penalties and sanctions against those schools that lie about certain types of earnings representations. Obviously, we wanna make sure that public resources are being used efficiently and that we're coordinating across the board. There's some existing memoranda of understanding and I, I will certainly look to determine whether anything needs to be updated to ensure that there's adequate cooperation with that office that you've referenced. Right, you know, the rise of, of interest in cryptocurrency has led to an increase in complaints submitted to the CFPB. A lot of folks in Congress are considering legislative proposals to regulate and, and oversee this crypto market and to protect consumers. So what role does the CFPB play in overseeing the crypto market and are there plans to work with SEC and Chair Gensler? So uh, as I reference to some of your colleagues, obviously the change in the payments landscape is one that everyone is paying close attention to. Last week, the CFPB issued a set of orders to Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, and others to gain information on their business practices related to their payment platforms. Of course, some of the, most of those payment platforms are primarily using the US dollar, but of course, um, there has been discussions in the marketplace about big tech also offering virtual currencies. Um, we will obviously be working with all the regulators um, to make sure that our payment system is fair, fast, and competitive. Okay, so what types of complaints would push you to begin examining possible deceitful practices when consumers are buying, selling, and trading crypto products? So um, we do know that there is a good amount of fraud in this marketplace. Uh, in some cases, that implicates um, you know, various state law enforcement, various federal law enforcement. There has been an uptick in those complaints. So um, I, I will make sure Sorry, that we I review that. Sir, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, and I need to yield back. Uh, we'll, we'll send it to you in writing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Director, thank you for being here today. I'm glad we get the chance uh, to question you early on in your tenure uh, at the CFPB. I want to ask uh, to start with a pretty straightforward question uh, related to the limits of the Bureau's authority. Does the CFPB uh, possess regulatory oversight over insurance products or insurance companies? 
So um, there's actually in the statute a specific exemption in Title from 10. the authority uh, for the business of insurance. Business of insurance is, is defined there, so no. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, let me continue on. The CFPB has UDAAP authority uh, with the two A's. That's unfair, deceptive, abusive acts and practices, as you know, but for those listening at home, I think it's important to say it. For many years, the CFPB seemed content with the uncertain definition of the term abusive, leaving the term vaguely defined, allowed the Bureau to regulate by enforcement. Uh, this has created real uncertainty for businesses, and it's stretched, into, and it's stretched the CFPB's authority into new areas. And I was encouraged when the CFPB issued a policy statement in January 24, 2020, providing a framework <coughs> for how it would apply the abusiveness standard. In that statement, the Bureau outlined clear principles explaining how and when it would rely on abusiveness to take a regulatory or supervisory action. I understand your predecessor, your predecessor in his acting capacity withdrew the policy statement. And so I want to build on Ranking Member McHenry's uh, in my colleague Mr. Barr's comments earlier on this issue uh, when he asked if you would restore the previous abusive statement uh, or provide a new one. You suggested it wasn't necessary. Why is that? Uh, I don't think I suggest it wasn't necessary. I think I said the ab abusive policy statement that was rescinded by my predecessor, um, I don't think it provided much of an analytical framework at all. What it said was that it would not plead, even when they believed there was a law violation, abusive, if it was also pled as unfair during certain circumstances. I don't think that's appropriate at all. That suggests that the agency can somehow you know, veto legislation that Congress has passed. Congress has put forth a number of prongs that would involve a, a prohibited abusive practice. I do, though, have a view that it's important for the CFPB to create a dur develop a durable abusive jurisprudence. There's many ways in which we can do this, but certainly the policy statement that was issued would not accomplish you, that. Let, let me, with our, with our limited time, you're saying there's many ways that you could do this. Are you looking to go and litigate this through the courts? Or are you planning to put forward a, a new policy statement on this to give clarity? I think all options are on the table. There's many ways in which agencies can help develop and clarify the law. A bedrock of the American system is our common law system in our, in our courts. Courts can review, they can issue opinions, we, we look at precedent, but also administrative agencies have the ability to issue policy statements, interpretive rules, guidance, and formal rules as well. So I think we can look at all of those. It's going to be, um, you know, based on the facts and circumstances. There are certain triggers where Congress has required the CFPB to issue rules under mm -hmm. UDAP. One is to have state AG enforcement against national banks, and the second is for FTC enforcement against non-banks. Um, but as it stands, um, there are many ways to do that, but I do not agree that the policy statement that was previously issued offered much clarity at all. Well, we'll respectfully disagree on that point, and that's okay, I suppose, for today's hearing. Uh, but I will caution that I think there's real concern uh, for, the, for, the, for the certainty that's needed in the market uh, to not move back to try to define this through a judicial process uh, in enforcement um, through uh, re regulation by enforcement. I think there's some real concerns there. Let me shift gears once again in our, in our, in our short remaining time left. Uh, we've discussed the value of predicted data uh, to make important credit and underwriting decisions. I'm a big believer that more data is better, allowing us to really provide credit to underserved communities uh, it can also help us control risk, get more substantial uh, or more stable financial systems. Do you believe that more data is helpful and will help those who are struggling to obtain credit? I think it depends. It often can lead to better credit decisions. What I worry about is when there's no transparency at all in how the decision was made. And then so we have a two-tiered system where the local bank serving their community is held to account and the algorithm maker or a lender, de depending on that, who can't even explain sometimes how a decision was made doesn't have to adhere to Cut. it. I don't think that's fair, but I think we want to make sure that we have an approach on how algorithms, machine learning, and AI um, are doing their work. Thank you for your, 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 your testimony today, recognizing the time I yield back. Thank you, sir.
The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for recognizing me. And Director Chopra, we are delighted to have you here today to echo my colleagues. Thank you for coming before us, and congratulations uh, on your confirmation and appointment to CFPB Director. I'm especially uh, thankful that the former student loan ombudsman is now the Bureau Director. Uh, I want to associate myself with Representatives Axney and Presley in some of their remarks and questions. Uh, and to that end, some of the latest federal student loan servicers, or excuse me, the largest uh, federal student loan servicers currently servicing federal student loan borrowers are ending or transferring their contracts with the Department of Education. They include Naviant, FIA, and Granite State. This is in addition to the end of the CARES Act forbearance on federal student loan payments back in January. Given these companies' checkered record of servicing borrowers, I am worried that both of these transitions could leave borrowers confused or without proper communication tools, causing potential record-keeping mistakes or the potential for increased defaults. Director Chopra, and I recognize you're on the job uh, two weeks, but with great uh, depth of experience, uh, how are you and the CFPB working or developing uh, to work on plans to ensure that borrowers are protected as their loan services are changed? Thank you so much for this question. You know, sloppy servicing when it comes to student loans has caused real pain for people. The errors that have been in their accounts, it has sometimes even spawned scams because people can't actually get things fixed. So it you know, these bad actors come and prey upon them. I think when it comes to large servicing transfers, we're gonna to have to work carefully with all the regulators, but especially the education department for the federal student loan book, because there needs to be an appropriate set of preparation for testing, re uh, uh, moving records with fidelity. If we have systemic errors, um, in that transfer, and you know, I don't know, maybe there are already systemic errors with some of their books, but if it gets worse and creates more disruptions or is unfairly penalizing people, it will create a lot of hardship, and many of those are younger people who are just starting out in life. So you have my commitment that we will use our tools and work with the other agencies to make sure we limit that exposure. Thank you for your focus on that, and you're absolutely right. I worry about the transfer of records that are already uh, corrupted or inaccurate. Do you have the resources you need uh, to make sure these transitions are made or to, to monitor and review how servicers are communicating with borrowers as they leave one servicer and move to another? Well, resources are always very constrained, and we'll have to be agile when it comes to you know, what we're facing, especially in the mortgage and student loan market, two of our biggest markets for, of, of debt that's owed by families. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, promise. Uh, during the Trump administration, I was concerned as I sat here on Financial Services Committee about their proposal to require the position of the student loan ombudsman to be reframed as the private education student loan ombudsman. Uh, under your leadership, will the student loan ombudsman coordinate with the Department of Education and once again provide support and guidance for all borrowers, not just private student loan borrowers? Yes, I'm going to assess uh, where we are with the activities related to our work and for students and borrowers and including the ombudsman's office to make sure that it's not necessarily, it's looking at the market in totality um, because we need to understand the full market, not just one part of it. Exactly right. Uh, and, and again, I will echo my concern that you have the resources you need for these extraordinarily important uh, economic tasks and oversight. And I share your concern about that and, and I will be sure to work with you and report back further. Wonderful, thank you, that's great. And final question, uh, one specific instance on the private student loan space uh, that I've been working on is the discharge of private student loans in the case of total and permanent disability of a borrower, a protection that exists for federal student loan borrowers. This actually came to us uh, by way of a constituent. Uh, would you support uh, efforts to ensure that this type of discharge is required on private student loans 
ensuring that those in a seriously dire health situation do not have to be bur burdened by cascading debt. So uh, many years ago, the CFPB put together a report on the auto defaults that were occurring when a borrower's often parent or grandparent died, um, and they were immediately thrown into default. It was a, a gruesome practice that I think was totally unacceptable. Um, but with respect to an individual's disability or death, um, I think uh, I'd need to look at our authorities on that. Um, I'm happy to get back to you, but I know some lenders are offering that, others are not, and it is a huge shock to people when, when their parent gets a, a bill for the whole balance. Exactly. I thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. There are countless examples of big tech companies shutting down competition and controlling the flow of information and free speech across the globe. Many have argued federal regulators in Congress missed the boat by allowing these tech companies to turn into the monopolies we have today. As one policymaker said, big tech companies can migrate from too small to care, to too big to ignore, to too big to fail very quickly. Around the world, big tech companies accounted for $700 billion of credit in 2020, which is a 40% increase on the prior year. Additionally, these big tech companies have come to account for 94% of mobile payments in China in just a few years. I want to caution the financial services industry that while working with big tech may look appealing now, you are making a deal with the devil. Director, if big tech companies continue to operate unregulated in the financial services industry, like they have in other sectors, do you have concerns they could eventually have a monopoly in yet another industry? Yes, I am worried that the big tech companies are coming for financial services. And while obviously we want technological progress and innovation, I'm uncomfortable with us not knowing almost anything about what they're up to, including their data surveillance, and as you mentioned, how they decide who gets kicked off, how are they gonna use their own incentives to make decisions. This is why the CFPB has issued orders to Facebook, Apple, Google, Amazon, and others. We need to understand this because this is an issue of consumer protection, systemic risk, and the protection of our country writ large. Um, it is something that I think this whole committee, I hope we can all work together on this because it is something we need to get right. I agree totally and thank you. As a former FTC commissioner, you bring a unique perspective to the CFPB. Do you believe federal regulators like the FTC and CFPB have the necessary tools to monitor big tech? That's a good question. Um, I certainly want to look at every tool we have as it relates to how they're entering into financial services, but as you know, most of those tech companies are not subject to supervision the way the banks are. So uh, I need to think about that more. Um, I will say that it is a very, very difficult circumstance I think we find ourselves in where a new market entrant has to constantly have the fear that one of those companies will just turn them off one day. Uh, I don't think that's very good. And what I see what is happening in China um, Actually, it makes me worried. I don't think we should go in that direction. Thank you. As a, also, as a former FTC commissioner, of course, you're familiar with allegations that several of these big tech companies have abused their market dominance at the expense of their consumers and their commercial partners, which you touched on briefly. Why, in your belief, is it appropriate to continue exploring anti-competitive conduct by big tech in your new role as director? And what ability does the CFPB have to restrain anti-competitive conduct that it might find in big tech's payment markets? So we actually have a different authority. Um, it's a different set of laws, but many of the concerns are similar. So the Congress has directed the CFPB to make sure that markets are fair, transparent, and competitive. There are many places in the statute that suggest that competition should be one we really think about innovation. So, of course, um, I want to be mindful about how I comment because I participated in the decision to file some of those lawsuits, um, and that litigation is ongoing uh, with the FTC. But there are many places where regulators should be promoting competition and innovation, 
in ways that are good for small businesses, good for families, and not just another way for dominant firms to control more and more about our lives. Thank you, and with respect to your efforts uh, against these big tech monopolies, I thank you for your work. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. Thank you, Director Chopra. Um, I'm so pleased to see CFPB uh, uh, December, I think, 2020. Um, you all have fi a final debt collection rule that goes into effect November 30th. So I'm really pleased because you know CFPB was does you know established to protect consumers, to protect our residents. I know there's been a lot of questions about the business sector in the certain industries, but that's not why we created the CFPB. And so I hope we center on the residents and the consumers. Um, and uh, as, as we move forward um, in prioritizing them. Director, do you think all debt should be treated the same? I think the answer is no. Uh. Oh, good. Because <laughs> nearly 20% of adults have one or more medical debt collection. Uh, yes. Oh. Yeah, listed on their credit report. And 90% of bankruptcies in our country, Director, is due to medical debt. Uh, and did you know that at the height of the pandemic last year, the three largest healthcare insurance companies ranked in 10.8 billion in a single quarter, while nearly 20 million of our neighbors were became unemployed. Um, so director, I'm worried. I'm worried that the pandemic not only left my residents with emotional trauma, but economic distress that could forever alter their ability to thrive because we treat all debt the same. I'm sure you are familiar that the December 2020 rule allows for the debt collectors to submit a physical or electro electronic message to the consumer and wait, quote, reasonable period of time to receive a notice of undeliverability. And you're nodding your head because you know this is very concerning, especially because. Uh, 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 Baby yesterday, she said, well, we need to do so, something like that. So you know that these debt collectors are likely to increase their use of electronic communications to consumers. And so, Director Kurt, given that digital divide that we have in our country and been exposed, I think, during the pandemic, what steps are C is C P CFPB taking to implement this rule in a way that protects communities like mine? Yeah, so I, I just have to share, Congresswoman, that um, what has happened to family balance sheets in many neighborhoods, it's been pretty devastating, and I think while there has been a recovery for many, many neighborhoods and households, they are still in deep debt from the struggles they face. And so I am worried about them being permanently scarred by that. And I think we want, if we want an equitable recovery, we're going to need to take a very close look at debt collection and credit reporting. Yeah, and Director, you know this. Some of these emails end up in spam. Uh, some of our folks are not, you know, broadband internet is not uh, reliable. I, I am just really increasingly worried because they are going to check it off and say, sent an electronic Understood. email. Understood. And so please, if you can follow up with my office on, on some of the steps you're going to take. In addition, you know that the rule would prohibit debt collectors from bringing or threatening to bring legal action to collect a time barred debt. Very important here. However, debt collectors often try to deceive consumers in restarting the statute of limitations. The Center for Responsible Lending has argued that CFPB should go further and outright prohibit the revival of debt bar debt. Um, Director Sherwood, will CFPB implement similar protections to prohibit the revival of time bar debt in full? Because several states, are, as you probably know, enacted law stating that the partial payments or other acknowledgement of debt would not revive the statute of limitations. Yeah, I am worried that some of this debt is getting bought, sold, That's right. resold, resold, and um, you know, f investment vehicles are trying to monetize it by squeezing them and collecting debt that is not owed anymore. So um, I, I want to take a look at the rule. Um, the rule is going into effect, but as I understand, the rule does not create any sort of safe harbor for collecting time barred debt. Yeah, but we should work together to prohibit the yes, revival. Yes, I, I would be happy to time do that. Time barred debt in full. I mean, again, more states are acknowledging it. Yes. I don't think, I think we can do something much more. Especially solid. with respect to the renewal of statute of limitations. That's right. Finally, you know, a National Consumer Law Center has suggested that CFPB's existing complaint database may not be adequate for tracking new complaints regarding electronic communication, such as receiving communication even after opting out or being able to read or open file attachments. Director Chopra, does the CFPB plan on adopting new debt collection complaint categories with regards to electronic communications following the December 2020 rule? 
I don't think there's current plans, but I would like to explore that because Please that do. seems like a good, given those changes, we need to make sure that Sometimes people have a piece of paper. That's we right. need to make sure they can provide that evidence. Yeah, and thank you. And, and, and know this, I'm working hard with the chairwoman to ban medically necessary debt on people's credit report. I think that's gonna help a tremendous deal, especially with the complaints that you get. But again, people's um, lives are forever altered uh, of what debt gets on these credit reports that prohib you know impact employment and housing. So thank you and I yield. If I may, Madam Chairwoman, just on the issue of medical debt on credit reports, there has been evidence in the past that it is completely not predictive of other performance. And I, I'm constantly worried that a patient is in, j just feels coerced to pay while their insurance company and a hospital are in an endless doom loop. And we cannot make, with the credit reporting system cannot be a way to extort payments out of patients. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate this. Uh, Director, thank you for being here. Congratulations on your confirmation. Um, if I could just talk to you about your enforcement perspective. You've shared a little bit of that during this hearing, particularly in your uh, statement that repeat offenders should be taken more severe, and I, I certainly concur with you on that point. Um, and the reason I ask you about that, in my, in my time in the Texas legislature dealing with the Office of Consumer Credit, which OC, OCCC, which would slightly yes. analogous to what you do, you know, their perspective was, if we find something going wrong, we're going to work with the business to try to fix it. If they keep doing it wrong, then we're going to hammer them. Um, my experience with your predecessors is that they had the opposite perspective. We're going to hammer them every time. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to actually try to correct, fix, help anybody. The, the problem with that, at least as I see it, is that then people don't want to talk to you. They don't want to tell you what's going on because they're afraid that if they show you, show the book, so to speak, and then you find something that you're going to hammer them. Is it your, your job to put pelts on the wall or is it your job to make the consumer space safer? Is it to make the financial services safe, space safer for consumers? Yeah, our, our job is to make it fair, transparent, and competitive. And I'll share with you directly that, of course, and, and, there are ways to resolve problems through the confidential supervisory process. Not all issues need to go to public law enforcement matters, but I, I just wanna put a finer point on something, which is when someone has been subject to a law enforcement order that they often have consented to, where they have agreed to make certain changes and they egregiously or don't follow it, I mean, this is a very severe problem to me. Sure. And when there is an order in place, that order is not a suggestion. That is, has the, it is a binding, it has the force of law. And we cannot have large players feel that these are just optional tip lists. No, I cer certainly concur with you on that point. Can I, can, can I get, an, a, do you think it's fair uh, that someone is pulled over and told, hey, this, the speed limit here is 20 miles an hour and there are no signs on the road? Is that fair? There are no signs of any no, kind. I, and I, I totally hear your point on this, that people should you know, not be harshly penalized for something that was not clear. And of course, sure. you know that the law does specify a number of factors that the Bureau must adhere to when seeking those penalties. Those are reviewable by the courts. And so we have to make sure that we are applying those factors fairly. And, and I share the view that when there is um, you know, an honest desire to play by the rules, it's, it's not appropriate to kind of harshly penalize that, and that's what the factors in the law push us to do. And, and I guess what I'm asking is for you to allow the rules that you make to season, I mean, to have a chance for people to know about them. Uh, I have seen agencies, not yours, but I've seen agencies produce rules in the middle of the enforcement saying, we got gotcha. you, here's this new rule, you've never seen it before, you're seeing it now and you're wrong. And I think you and I would agree that's unfair to that particular. Well, I, it would also, you know, this, the fact pattern you mentioned may actually be unconstitutional in that, you know, there is the, in the legal process when going to court, a court will assess, um, you know, the entire notice issues and number of factors. So this is why I raised with some of your colleagues um, the importance of the CFPB focusing on large market actors 
causing widespread harm. Of course, there'll be smaller players that may need to be addressed, and I'm sure the enforcement docket, and, and there's a lot of backlog. Um, but generally, we should be we, focusing those resources against those who we know, they know the rules, they know the law, they're well-resourced, they can fight in court, um, but going after small players, um, you know, this is just, I, I saw this too much at the FTC um, under Republicans and Democrats, and, and I just, it, it didn't sit well with me at all. Sure, and, and in my final 30 seconds, I'll just share my own thought on why smaller players are having a more difficult time operating the market, and I think actually Mr. Hill mentioned that in his, in his uh, colloquy with you, and is that the, the increased regulations as a result of Dodd-Frank have created a very difficult environment for smaller financial institutions. I'm speaking, speaking of banks, uh, you know, when Dodd-Frank passed, there were about, there were about 8,500 banks in the United States. There are now about 5,000. And that, that compression, that smaller group of banks, they're all bigger. The average size of banks has gone up because the only way to survive financially is to consolidate, be bigger, so that you have a bigger core of assets to handle the regulatory burden that has been thrust upon them by this body. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, the ranking member for holding this uh, important uh, hearing. And of course, I want to thank uh, Director Chopra for your service at the CFPB and for joining us today. I can say the CFPB is in good hands. A financial regulatory agency focused on consumers is crucial. It's easy for other financial regulators to forget that in every loan, every refinancing, every repossession, every deposit, every fee, we're talking about a family home or the car they use to get to work or cash for groceries. The CFPB doesn't forget that and that's critical. Consumer data is an important issue in almost every industry but it's particularly important for the financial industry because who knows more about you than your bank? This is one reason why the, his, the historic separation of banking and commerce has become more important in the 21st century, not less. The trust and data access in a banking relationship is dangerous in the hands of a commercial company, not only for customers, but for commercial markets and competition. In February of this year, the FDIC issued an order subjecting uh, ILCs to the privacy standards in the graham leachy bliley Act, but the, that protection doesn't extend to their parent companies. Mr. Chopra, as you know, in other committees, uh, Congress has extensively covered uh, just how aggressive and invasive companies like Facebook and Amazon are with customer data. Questions is, if these companies own the bank through an ILC, would it be hard for regulators like the CFPB or FDIC to tell if they truly kept consumer data in the bank behind a firewall? And do you think that this lack of oversight could pose a real risk to consumers and competitors? Sir, firewalls are extremely difficult to monitor and enforce, and once they are breached, it's almost impossible to undo. So, you know, with respect to your question about particularly tech companies getting into financial services and the unimaginable amounts of data that they collect on all of us, it would be very hard to administer that. Thank you for uh, that succinct response. Uh, I represent a working class immigrant district in Chicago. Remittances mean a lot to my constituents and to their families in other countries. We know the problem with our remittance system, but cryptocurrencies are coming into the market fast. El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as a national currency. Facebook is launching a new digital currency under the guise of sending remittances between the U.S. and Guatemala. Is the CFPB examining cryptocurrency as a consumer financial product and what laws, rules, and regulations must be in place to protect consumers seeking services like remittances? So the Electronic Funds Transfer Act and its implementing regulations, including the remittance rule that was required by Congress, govern um, remittance transfers. 
you know, Congressman, it's obviously something that's changing very, very rapidly about how families are sending money to their families, especially those families overseas. I think we want a remittance market that is fast, fair, cheap. Um, I don't have an exact answer for you uh, at this point. It's a, a only been two weeks, but I hear you loud and clear that we need to make sure we fully understand the changes in the market so that we can administer our enforcement and that we can make sure that those families are protected. Uh, fair enough, it has only been two weeks. Uh, I hope to follow up uh, on this uh, subject with you. It affects many people in many communities throughout the country, uh, a diverse uh, immigrant community that uh, you know, is engaged in remittances very deeply. Uh, thank you so much and I wish you uh, really good luck in your position, sir. Thank you, sir. I yield back, ma'am. Thank you. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations, Director Chopper, on your recent confirmation. Uh, I hope we can find some areas to work together on to serve the American people in the coming years. Uh, I'm going to start with a question about post, post offices. Uh, do you know how many complaints the CFPB has received about the United States Post Office this year? Probably I not don't. offhand. Yeah. Mail delivery, you, we got a lot of people sending bills allegedly, nobody's getting them. Um, I've had some issues myself. Um, it, it is an issue, I, I do believe. Maybe you can look into it and get back to me. But um, you know, all these efficiencies and arguably incompetence of the post office have resulted in many of my constituents and my colleagues' constituents across the country having late payments to creditors. Um, I've recently discovered that despite the post office's inability to accomplish their mission of delivering the mail in a timely manner, uh, many people now want them to offer financial services products that would compete with the private sector. So uh, would you agree or would you not agree that the post office maybe ought to focus simply on delivering the mail to make sure that our constituents have their payments delivered on time instead of expanding in areas that distract from their uh, core mission? Well, I don't have a view on your specific question. I do know that the post office has been looking to change and make sure it's more financially sustainable by offering ancillary services, by leveraging their existing um, post office footprint. I do understand that there's some places where they sell prepaid cards or where they um, may be helping with money orders or other sorts of transfers, but I, I, I take your point. Um, it's not an area that I've studied very carefully. Sure. I, I have a gym and a yoga studio, and I really hope the federal government doesn't start paying uh, to allow people to work out for free and, you know, do yoga. But um, moving on to a different topic, uh, many of the enforcement actions issued recently by the Bureau have named company owners by name. Uh, the reason for these allegations appears to simply be the fact of ownership of a business. Uh, this would appear to penalize small businesses uh, small business owners over public companies whose shareholders and CEOs are not being named in CFPB enforcement actions and lawsuits. Uh, earlier today, you uh, talked about how enforcement actions against smaller players often kills their business while having a much more marginal impact on larger players. So it would appear that you might agree this discrepancy should end. Uh, will you commit to naming individuals only in circumstances where facts show those people actually committed unlawful uh, acts? Yeah, this is actually a very important issue. I think my, one of my experiences um, as a regulator, including at the Federal Trade Commission, which was the FTC essentially said, if you're a small company, we're naming, we're naming the individuals. If it's a big firm, whatever. We took big steps to change that. I vigorously opposed the FTC settlement that gave Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook matter an immunity clause you have my commitment that when it comes to large financial institutions, if there is evidence to suggest that individuals were involved in directing lawbreaking, we will look to determine whether to name them. And conversely, perhaps stop naming individuals with small businesses unless they, in fact, were possibly... Uh, well, of course. We should, we should not name an individual unless we have reason to believe in the evidence to suggest that. And to the extent there is a discrepancy between how we're treating small businesses and big businesses, I agree that we have not paid enough attention to individual liability 
on large firms, and I take your point on the small firm aspect. Sure, I really do appreciate that answer. Um, one more question. Uh, can you commit to publicly releasing all of the facts and data that are used to support your decisions during the rulemaking and enforcement process? Um, Just a transparency component? I think with respect to that question, there may be places where we are not able to release um, all of the information. There's rules governing that, as particularly in the enforcement process and supervisory process. Here's one thing I am trying to do for certain types of matters, in addition to just you know a press release, I've also uh, have been trying in certain circumstances to issue an accompanying statement that outlines some of the logic and analytical framework that was used. We recently did an enforcement action where I explained um, a little bit more about the claims and counts that were in it. So I, I, I agree with you on wanting to be more transparent and communicate more, but I, I, we have to respect sure, no. laws and Just other things. Wherever possible, um, the, helping people understand the, the decision making yes. would be helpful. Thank you for being here today, and uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank sir. you. The gentleman from Texas, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I too want to add my congratulations to the director and hope for to work with you in the next uh, couple of years as we work through some of these processes. In my district, which is very similar to um, Mr. Garcia of Chicago, financial services are not broadly used. In fact, many still rely on credit more re rely more on credit unions, uh, check cashing services, remittances, money orders and still a lot of cash activity. Uh, we're a community of hardworking, diverse families who rely on critical financial <coughs> services only to try usually to access credit. And as you know, access to credit is also about accumulating wealth. Uh, at, so for us, it, it means that without all of that closing and, and being able to access that credit, we'll never do much about reducing the racial wealth gap. I think you're, you've talked about that some. And um, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act allows institutions to develop special purpose credit programs, SBCPs, which include tailored approaches to meet the credit needs of and directly benefit economically and socially disadvantaged groups. Again, my district is about 77% Latino. It's over 50% disadvantaged. According to recent reports by the National Fair Housing Alliance, in the National Consumer Law Center, SBCPs can be critical tools for addressing the legacy of discrimination in the mortgage market, promoting equity and inclusion, and closing the racial wealth gap. Last December, the CFPB issued an advisory opinion promoting the use of SBCP programs among creditors. What steps has the CFPB taken to facilitate the use of these programs in the financial marketplace? It's a great question, and I uh, want to share, I share this interest completely about how we can both simultaneously increase trust in the financial system, but also make sure that the financial system isn't widening inequities and gaps, but is actually part of closing it and part of making sure that everyone can access the opportunities that they seek to, particularly when it comes to housing. I've, I'm going to ask uh, the staff to give me more of a review of the use of special purpose credit programs. It's something I know that I'm, I'll be keen to talk to the other regulators in the Treasury Department about, but I do think it is one of many ways that we can ensure there is not discriminatory lending, but also take steps to reverse some of the you know disgusting redlining practices of the past. Right. And, um, and just to be clear, you, you are the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right? Emphasis on consumer. That's exactly right. So what are you doing to ensure that your agency is, is inclusive and diverse um, in its practices, in its programs? Uh, and specifically, I'm always concerned about financial literacy and in materials from your agency and in programming that would be be reflective of the language, the language spoken in 
around different languages spoken around the country. Yeah, I, I just language, see a lot of language barriers in financial transactions. There is, and I think we should be embracing the fact that a strength of our country is, um, you know, having so many people from um, all over the world and being able to engage in commerce and banking in a way that they can understand and is comfortable. Um, I do want to look at our authorities to be able to support those institutions who share that points of view. Being inclusive, um, it's not just about having, you know, one, one brochure in Spanish. It has to go much, much farther than that. So um, I don't have a great specific answer for you right now, but I completely share um, what you're saying, and, and, and I'm going to think more and look into what what authorities we have to advance that goal. Right, in, but within your own materials, your own implementation of some of your programs, you will work to ensure that they are reflective of the language that is spoken in, in the different parts of the country. That's right, and I want to make sure in particular, I've set a goal that our consumer complaints should be broadly reflective in terms of the geographies that we serve across our country, and including the languages we serve. Already, we image, uh, in the past, uh, there has been more languages where consumers can call, file complaints. Um, I wanna see how that's going. Well, thank you, and I see my time is up, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Achenkloss, who is also the vice chair of the full committee, is now recognized for five minutes. I understand that Mr. Achenkloss uh, has left the room. Um, so at this time, I'd like to thank our very distinguished witness for his testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witness for this <coughs> response. I ask Director Chopra to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>